Lucknow. Good evening, Vanakam, and welcome to the uh, 2023 Indology Festival organized by Tamil Heritage Trust. Uh, we are indeed delighted to have your presence uh, in this week long uh, Indology Festival, our third Indology Festival that we are celebrating from uh, Tamil Heritage Trust. Uh, before we go ahead with uh, this week's program, I would like to give a brief introduction of Tamil Heritage Trust and its activities. Tamil Heritage Trust is a uh, not-for-profit, volunteer-driven organization that has been functioning for the last 13 years and has been conducting several activities towards the uh, dissemination and appreciation of India's rich cultural heritage. Towards this, we conduct several programs. Uh, the most uh, prominent of them being the uh, monthly heritage talks. Uh, we do two heritage talks every month. Uh, the uh, one on the first Saturday is in English. This happens completely online. And then on the third Saturday of every month, we do a in-person and online a hybrid talk, which is in Tamil. The uh, topics for these monthly talks are across various aspects of Indian heritage, like uh, literature, uh, art, architecture, dance forms, music, uh, music, epigraphy, and, and so on. The uh, talks are generally delivered by both uh, enthusiasts as well as experts in these fields. Next, we also conduct uh, what is a called a Pechikacheri, which is a themed seminar that is spread over two days, happens typically during the month of uh, December. Uh, we have conducted nearly 10 editions of Pech Kacheri. Our last uh, Pech Kacheri was held around the theme of uh, Vijayanagara. So this was a two-day seminar which was centered around Vijayanagara, a city, a dynasty, and an empire. And this had 10 experts talking to us about various facets of Vijayanagara uh, impact. Uh, we also conduct uh, several workshops. These are paid workshops that we conduct for uh, the general public. Uh, these workshops are around uh, temple appreciation, museum appreciation. We also conduct workshop on uh, the Pallava Granta. We also do uh, site seminars, which is basically our annual heritage trip to a place, uh, to a heritage site within India, where a group of us come together and uh, prepare ourselves for the uh, heritage trip. And then um, we prepare, uh, you know, pretty deep for this uh, trip, give PowerPoint presentations, and also go there as well-informed uh, well people. These are uh, site seminars that we do. We also engage with uh, school teachers across Tamil Nadu through our program called Alamar Kawai, uh, Teachers for Heritage, where we work with the uh, school teachers and uh, enable them to become ambassadors of Indian heritage and Indian culture in the schools where they work. We also institute uh, a few awards. Uh, this is uh, the V. Venkaya Award that uh, Tamil Heritage Trust hosts. And uh, this is uh, instituted by uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Sunita Madhavan. Uh, the award, the V. Venkaya Award, is for somebody who has done outstanding service in the field of epigraphy. Uh, the award was first hosted in the year 2022. We'll, we'll be doing it in 2023 also. And uh, the award was of, uh, given to Dr. Y. Sukurayu. So this is an award which we'll be hosting once again in 2023. We also institute the uh, THD Professor S. Swaminathan Award. Professor S. Swaminathan is a uh, co-founder. We have been instituting this award for the last uh, three years since 2020. And the award is meant to recognize an individual who has done outstanding service towards uh, uh, dissemination, uh, preservation, and understanding of Indian heritage. Uh, if you wish to take part in our programs, if you wish to receive notification on our programs, you can send us an email uh, to admin at tamilheritage.im and we will be happy to include you on any notifications of future programs. All our uh, programs are also available on YouTube. So if you go on to YouTube and if you type Tamil Heritage Trust, you should receive, uh, if you click on the channel, if you click on the bell button, you should be able to receive notification of all our events. Uh, Indology Festival. Like I said, this is the uh, third Indology Festival that uh, we are conducting. The first one happened in uh, 2020, uh, which was on a wide range of topics from uh, uh, prehistory uh, to uh, Indian mathematics, 
uh, to temple architecture, uh, to Chola bronzes and, and, and whatnot. So this was the first one that we did in 2020. Our second Indology festival that happened in 2022 was a, a week long. It was actually a five day uh, festival around the temple builders of medieval India. So we took the uh, various dynasties that ruled India between the 8th and the 13th century and uh, looked at the art at the temples that they built. And we had a series of lectures over, the, uh, over 15 lectures, starting from uh, you know, Imperial Cholas, later Pandyas, and Kakatiyas. And other. So we did a series of lectures around the temple builders of medieval India. So 2023 Indology Festival, Sagara Sangam, India and the Sea. India has had a very long and a rich maritime history that dates back to several millennia. Uh, India is a country that has a vast coastline. It has always been connected with the sea. The subcontinent was a hub of maritime trade, a key link between Asia in the East, the Middle East, Europe, and Africa in the West. Indian religions like Buddhism and Hinduism spread to Southeast Asia and you know, took the maritime trade routes. India's cultural and artistic traditions, such as temple building and sculpture, found their way to other parts of the world, essentially through the maritime connections. The flourishing kingdoms and cities along India's coast helped to shape our history in many ways that still endure today. Our Indology Festival 2023 is primarily to explore this diverse and vibrant history, this maritime history that India has been part of. Over the next seven days, starting today until the 11th of June, you will have 14 scholars, experts, who are going to talk to you about India's fascinating 3000 year journey across India's long coastline. And they're going to talk to you about a wide range of topics pertaining to Indian maritime history. So why should you be part of this? In this THD Indology Festival, you will learn all of the above, many of the above. You will learn about the maritime connection of the coastal settlements of the Harappan times. You will find out how important India's trading ports were with the Greek or Romans in the first century, in the first century scene. You will get a glimpse of the shipbuilding technologies of ancient and medieval India. You will understand how Buddhism and Hinduism crossed the sea to establish a foothold in Southeast Asia. You can marvel at the ingenuity and global reach of India's traders from East Africa to Malacca. Investigate the epigraphic evidence for Rajendra Chola's explorations. Appreciate commonalities and differences in the development of maritime relations of different religions, regions. Rediscover the forgotten naval histories of the Marathas and be surprised by the pirates of the Indian Ocean. You're going to be witnessing several colorful characters like the Kachi merchants, the Buddhist monks, naval captains, Cambodian emperors, pirates, and red emperors. So join us and hop on to this exciting journey as we take you through this week-long Indology Festival 2023. With this, we begin our first, first day's program. Our first speaker for the day, we have Dr. Himanshu Prabhare. Dr. Himanshu Prabhare is currently a visiting fellow, ASEAN India Center, Research and Information System for Developing Countries, New Delhi, Honorary Professor, Distant Worlds, Munich Graduate School of Ancient Studies, Ludwig Maximilian University, Munich, and a member board of governors, Oxford Center for Hindu Studies in Oxford. She was formerly chairperson of the National Monuments Authority, Ministry of Culture and former professor, Center of Historical Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. She holds a BA in English and an MA in Sanskrit, both from the University of Punjab, Chandigarh, a diploma in archaeology from the School of Archaeology, ASI, an MPhil in archaeology from the University of Cambridge, and a PhD in early historical trade from JNU Delhi. She's written several books. Some of her books include Beyond Trade, Cultural Roots of Indian Ocean, The Return of Buddha, Ancient Symbols for a New Nation, the Legacy of Sir Mortimer Wheeler in India, The Winds of Change, Buddhism and Maritime Links of Early South Asia. South Asia. She's also published research papers on oceanography, maritime archaeology, Buddhism and Satavahanas. She has been part of several explorations and surveys within India and abroad. 
She's also the recipient of various awards and distinctions and has been a speaker at various conferences and seminars. We are deeply grateful to Dr. Ray for her encouragement and support. She helped with the design of this event. It is very key to mention that she has been very instrumental in the design of this event. She made suggestions on topics to be covered and was and also shared contact details of some of the speakers who are going to be part of this event. In fact, it is not an exaggeration to say that her extensive work in the field of maritime history has served as an inspiration for all of us and from the trust. We now welcome Dr. Himanshu Prabhare to deliver the keynote address on commemorating India's maritime heritage, in which she will focus on India's coastal monuments and their interconnections across seas and also on the conceptualization of waters in Indian adventure. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would like to congratulate Tamil Heritage Trust for organizing this series of lectures, um, which um, I really appreciate. Uh, they're very close to my own research interest, and um, it's really a pleasure to be a part of this larger initiative. Uh, so uh, congratulations um, and uh, good wishes for your success in this and in other ventures. So let me start by, uh, by going on to my lecture today. Uh, let me just start by sharing my screen um, and um, talking about the theme that I have chosen uh, for this lecture today, uh, which is um, commemorating um, India's maritime heritage. Um, let me start by uh, discussing about this, uh, about the topic and the theme. Why do I choose the term heritage? And why do I not talk about maritime history? Um, I would like to make, as an academic, I would like to make this distinction uh, that history is a discipline. It has its own structures. It has its own, um, uh, own um, disciplinary boundaries um, and really essentially discusses about the past. As compared, as compared to history and in contrast to history, Heritage is really our inheritance. Heritage is what we have received from our ancestors, from our forefathers, what they have preserved and what they have found appropriate to hand over to us. Um, heritage then covers um, not just, it draws on history, it covers not just information about the past, but it also includes materiality and, and was mentioned um, uh, by Mr. Krishna that it also includes monuments. Uh, monuments is something that I have been working on, especially um, as I was um, at the National Monuments Authority, Ministry of Culture, and is, um, uh, is a theme um, uh, which I feel has been neglected, especially coastal monuments. Uh, which need to be brought into the discussion on maritime networks. And hence, in this lecture, in this opening uh, remarks, um, I would like to focus on, um, on, um, uh, on uh, coastal monuments and on heritage. But let me start from the basics. Let me start by looking at the map of India. And here's a map of India. Now, something that strikes both you and me is the enormous blue that you see on this map, the enormous coastline. Um, the fact that um, India really has a large coastline of 7,500 or more than 7,500 kilometers, um, which is part of several states and union territories. And it's quite surprising. And I say this uh, with some concern uh, that maritime history is still under-researched. Maritime history is still not taught uh, in our schools, colleges, and universities. Um, and so, hence, I, I really think this is a great topic that you've chosen uh, to present this, um, this festival, this week-long festival uh, that the Tamil Heritage Trust is conducting. Uh, why, you could ask me, why is it that maritime history has not been uh, discussed? Why is it that people don't give enough attention to it? Now, there are a couple of points which um, have been around and which have been given as reasons why um, Indians um, did not travel across the seas, which as you will hear in this series is not correct. 
Um, and one of the reasons that's given is that the Indian coastline is very straight. And you can see this for yourself on this map. It is not indented. And hence, it did not provide natural harbors. And that was one of the reasons why um, uh, we do not have adequate natural harbors uh, along the coastline. This is not a good reason, I would argue, because most of the harbors, most of the landing places that we see in India were located not on the coast, but on the banks of the rivers. And as you know, um, starting from the Indus here uh, and all a lot of our rivers uh, uh, rise inland and flow out into the sea, whether it's Gujarat, whether it's the Ghats, the Maharashtra coast, the Narmada, the Tapti, or whether it's the Kaveri uh, in the Tamil coast, the Mahanadi or the Ganga uh, in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, the landing places then were not uh, quite on the coast. The coast is um, gets the tidal waves. Uh, it gets, gets the strong currents. Uh, so what was more appropriate, what was considered um, invaluable was the fact that these landing places and uh, were on rivers um, of a little distance away from the coast. So it's not that we didn't have harbors. It's not that um, we did not have um, places where ships could land. But what did happen is that in the colonial period or with the coming of the Europeans, um, much of the cities, many of the cities, Madras being a good example, but Bombay, Calcutta, uh, and many others, uh, they were situated now where the Europeans founded factories and where, uh, and these were on the coast. So there was a change in the colonial period. So let's not look at the past through colonial lens. Let's look, uh, let's look at the past in its own terms. And uh, what made maritime mobility possible? And what were the kind of ships that were used? Uh, who were the people who traveled? What was carried on these ships? So these are a whole set of questions that become important um, when, we look at, uh, when we look at the pre-European past. Let's look at the present from, the, from geography. Let's look at our constitution. And um, as a lot of you know, um, the Indian constitution, of course, like all constitutions in the world, is a political document. But where the Indian constitution is unique is that it draws on history. So our constitution, it integrates history um, with politics. Now, how is this brought about, you would ask me? How is it that they draw on history and you know, integrate the two, history and politics? Uh, this is done through the paintings that uh, Nandalal Bose, who was a famous painter, uh, that he, the paintings that he did um, in the first lithographed copy of the Indian constitution. And you can see these paintings, they are available online, but there's also copies um, of the first, doc, the first lithographed um, constitution of India. That version is, are also available for sale. And you can see these very beautiful paintings. And this is just one example. Uh, which is uh, page 181 of the Constitution of India. And the two paintings, which I would like to draw your attention to, are the paintings of these two um, um, boats or ships. The top one, uh, and, you, and the reason I also bring this in, is to draw your attention um, to the prehistory of sailing, as it were. The first one on top is a Mohanjadaro boat. It was found during the excavations at Mohanjadaro, which is a Harappan site, dates to the third millennium BCE. The site is today in Pakistan. The bottom one, um, uh, which was also, or which has also been used um, uh, as a logo for this series of talks, um, is a sailing ship, which occurs on uh, a Buddhist monument, on a Buddhist temple. This Buddhist temple is located in central Java uh, at Borobudur in Indonesia, dates to the eighth century. The reason why I draw your attention to these two images is the fact that even when Nandalal Bose was drawing on history, was drawing on the past, he did not forget the oceans of India. And in this last section on his, where he talks about the physical features, where he talks about the rivers and the mountains, he also brings in the oceans and brings in these two, uh, these two prominent examples um, of boats and ships 
which are on monuments. The first one, of course, is terracotta. It's a model. Um, it's not on a monument. The second one is a relief. It is carved on a monument um, and uh, can be seen if you travel to Indonesia or if you travel to Borobudur in Java. Uh, so the point then is um, the um, both the geography and our present indicates that um, the oceans have been very important to us. And that is something which uh, we should be paying more attention to than what we have done. What made sailing possible? What was it that allowed ships to sail? And here it is the monsoons, the monsoon winds, um, which really made maritime mobility possible across the seas. Um, what, is, what is important about the monsoons is that they are predictable. Uh, they flow um, in certain directions, northeast monsoon uh, from the ocean to the land uh, in December to January, and the southwest monsoon, which should be appearing anytime now, or at least in Kerala and in Delhi, not so soon, um, is, um, uh, comes during the months of June um, to, to August. Uh, the reason why these monsoons are important is that what one is looking at in the, re in the period that I'm talking about, that is prior to the coming of the Europeans, uh, the kind of boats or ships that we had did not have engines. They were not uh, mechanized. These were sailing ships. And sailing ships, as you know, depend on the winds. And the winds that were important are the monsoon winds. Uh, these winds are very powerful at certain times of the year at the peak season. So the sailing ships were made of wood, uh, I'll talk, I'll show you some visuals of the sailing ships in a moment. But these sailing ships, while they use the winds for sailing across different uh, parts of the Indian Ocean, um, and the monsoons made the voyage predictable and the home journey returned back to India predictable. But the monsoons also uh, meant or the at, that at its height, uh, when the winds were very strong, uh, no sailing occurred. And that period, the period from uh, May to um, um, June, July, the height of the Southwest monsoon was used along the coastline for repair of these wooden ships. So please remember the, the period that we are looking at, we are looking at sailing ships. Uh, we are looking at uh, geographical patterns which allowed these ships to sail, um, but which, which also made sailing quite dangerous and risky. So we also need to factor in um, uh, the point that um, safety was a major concern um, to, the, to, the, to the people, the navigators or the ship captains uh, who use these uh, sailing ships. It's not just that in India, we were dependent on the monsoons. The winds occur in a big way also uh, in Greek writings. And um, here on your screen, um, I have put, uh, I show you uh, a map. This is a 15th century map. It's not a map of the early period, but it uses Ptolemy's, Claudius Ptolemy's tables. Claudius Ptolemy lived 90 to 168 CE. So it uses the first and second century uh, CE tables that Ptolemy provided and um, uh, it, shows you that what was the nature of the world that even the Europeans uh, were familiar with in the 15th century, which is uh, you know, a much later period than what I will be talking about. Um, so what, uh, what does come up? Uh, if you look at the, the peninsular India, it almost doesn't exist. Uh, there's no peninsula out here. Uh, the map shows, yes, certainly it shows the Mediterranean, it shows the Indian Ocean. Uh, the Red Sea is um, depicted uh, in a somewhat strange way, not the, not the way in which we know it is from our modern maps. But what is important about this map is that if you look at these arrows that I have put, uh, these are the 12 winds or the wind heads that ring the map. And Ptolemy's map highlights again the point that I made earlier that it is the winds that were considered very important in a period when we don't have GPS, we don't have cartography um, as we know it today, we don't have mechanized engines. And so this is a period which is very different from the one that's familiar to us 
um, in this day and age. So now let's move on. So what do I mean by maritime heritage and um, what is included in it and what is left out? So I would argue that maritime heritage includes the spread of religions. Um, what, is, what I find quite fascinating is the spread of writing. Um, and again, um, um, there's a lot of diffusion of the Brahmi script. Brahmi is used for, um, uh, for a variety of languages um, all across the Indian Ocean. The languages may be different, but the script, the writing is something which uh, comes from India. We need to pay more attention to. I really would like to see much more work on this than has been done. Yes, trade has been talked about. Uh, it was mentioned earlier. Uh, but migrations, uh, people also moved. It's not just that, you know, there was movement of commodities, uh, but people moved, there was movement of ideas and technologies. So maritime um, heritage, I would argue, covers an enormous field, covers many themes, and it's only now that we are paying attention to it. And so there's much more that needs to be done in the future. The second point, and this point I would like to make quite strongly, I have said about sailing ships, I've said that um, it was really the non-mechanized um, vessels, water, um, uh, water vessels that were used for traveling. But who was traveling on this? Was it people of one ethnicity, uh, one religion? Who were these people? Um, and did they come from only one area? Were they all Indians? Were they all Greeks? You know, were they all Hindus? Were they all Buddhists? Uh, I think we need to bear this in mind that the people, just like the people today, any crew that you see on a ship is multi-ethnic, multi-religious. This is something that we need to uh, remember um, that the people who traveled came from all parts of the Indian Ocean. They followed several religions. Um, uh, there, was, there were also religious teachers who traveled. It was not just that it was the crew or the captain who traveled or the sailors. A religious uh, teachers traveled. And something which I found quite fascinating um, in many of the texts that I have seen, uh, musicians traveled, scribes traveled, so music traveled. Again, you know, food, um, there were variations in food um, as people traveled. Uh, so this is a field which provides us opportunities to discuss not just, uh, you know, trade and religion, but a whole range of cultural commodities, uh, you know, uh, food being one, textiles, um, and music is something, again, uh, which travels across the ocean, um, and again, is something that we need far more uh, information on. Now, if you look at the ship itself, just the making of the ship meant uh, that commodities had to be got from different parts of the Indian Ocean. So many of the wooden ships, because teak comes from India, teak was good, uh, it was strong, it was used for making ships, and even in Arabia, ships were made, you know, the sailors, um, the um, craftsmen uh, who, um, uh, who were involved in the construction of ships, they used wood from India. Uh, the coir, because these were, and this is something which um, you may be unfamiliar with, and I will show, show you um, a, a visual in a moment. Uh, these were stitched uh, ships. They were not, I have said, these were not nailed, uh, iron nails were not used in the early vessels, but they were stitched. So it's much like um, you stitch a cloth or you stitch a garment. Um, so the ships were stitched and you will see, this is, a, this is a, a tradition that still continues and you can still see it on the Indian coastline. Uh, but the rope for this came from the islands, from the Maldives. The commodities which traveled on these ships came from different parts of the Indian Ocean. And um, uh, uh, so it was really, um, it was really, should one put it, a cosmopolitan using a modern word, um, a cosmopolitan venture, or, um, uh, you know, if you would like to use another term, that's fine. Uh, but what it also required and what it also meant, um, and this is taking off from what I mentioned earlier, that um, the ships were dependent on, uh, on the winds, that there were no maps, no GPS. How do you recognize the coast? So if one is coming from the, from the sea, coming from the water, how do you recognize which part of the coast, whether it's the Indian coast or the Gulf coast, has the ship reached? And it is here that coastal structures, coastal shrines, 
postal markers become very important. So bear this in mind, please, that we are looking at a very different environment um, and a very different uh, scenario than what we see or know of today. So these are two visuals. Um, this is from the Kanara coast. Um, uh, the one that you see on the left, that is, you can see the stitching. Um, and um, this is very clear. These are all wooden ships. Uh, there are still, uh, today, I, um, there are very few sailing. I don't think ships sail. Um, these wooden boats are made, the dhows, but uh, engines are used. They use mechanized engines uh, and not quite sailing vessels. The Navy still uses sailing ships to train, but these are iron ships, iron, uh, uh, you know, ships made of iron, uh, not wooden ships. Um, so, but these, um, these are now, these wooden ships, the stitched wooden ships uh, really travel up and down the coast. They don't do transoceanic sailing um, and are used for fishing. So the whole way in which this tradition has changed is dependent on uh, the, uh, the fact that we have brought in new technologies, which has made some of this, should one say, obsolete for transoceanic sailing, but they still exist uh, for coastal and for uh, particularly in Kerala for inland um, um, uh, uh, shipping as well. Uh, these are the boats with outriggers. You can see this outrigger here. Uh, this is from um, the Goa coast. These outriggers that you see is a kind of balancing board, should one say, um, are really um, a Southeast Asian um, uh, tradition. Uh, one sees this quite often, and one sees it also on the Borobudur ship. So the point is that there was not one kind of ship. There were many kind of uh, ships that were built. These were built, uh, these were wooden ships. Um, and um, were built at coastal centers. Uh, we still have some surviving ones. Uh, Mandavi is one which makes it house. Uh, Bepur um, on the Kanara coast is another. Some of these are uh, very nicely uh, painted in uh, our ancient monuments. Uh, here I show you a sailing ship. Uh, this is from one of the uh, paintings in the Ajanta Caves. Now, before I talk about the ship, I would like to say that Ajanta Caves, these are Buddhist caves, I'm sure, World Heritage uh, Sites. It's a World Heritage Monument known for its painting, known for its Buddhist caves. Um, but what, what, is, um, what is equally important is that um, these Buddhist caves in these paintings, um, they also depict ships. And the context of these ships is interesting. So the ships um, at Ajanta are shown in three contexts. Um, and these stories are stories, uh, these are Jataka stories. Jataka stories are the stories of the previous life of the Buddha. So these are Buddhist stories, right? These are not history. These are not sort of um, historical texts. These are Buddhist Jataka stories. Um, and these stories narrate the previous lives of the Buddha. Um, and also highlight a certain value or a certain moral or an ethical value at the end of it. So there are three kinds of contexts in which these ships are shown. The first one is um, in the context of merchants who are traveling. And there is in cave one, um, and there is the, uh, the story of Kalyana Karin, who was a merchant um, and who traveled the ocean because he wanted to uh, make money and money largely for philanthropy. So making money was fine as per the Buddhist Jatakas, but it needed to be spent for philanthropy um, and not you know, for, um, for various other purposes. The second one, and this is the painting that, I, that you see on your screen, that's cave two. Um, this is from the Purnavadana. Why it is interesting is because it shows the Buddha or the Bodhisattva uh, who was born as a navigator. Um, and he was born as a navigator at the place at a place called Sopara. Sopara, as you know, is close to Mumbai on the west coast of India. Um, he and this Jataka is quite interesting because then it talks about the qualities of the navigator. So when the Bodhisattva was born as a navigator, he had certain qualities which made him uh, a very um, uh, a very sought after navigator. What were these qualities? Uh, he could read the stars. Uh, he could see decide which part of the ocean it was by seeing the 
um, the waters, the color of the waters, by seeing the vegetation in the, these are all signs and signals which we do not, um, should one say, which we do not acquire or anymore. You know, we today we depend on books or I suppose charts telling us where we are and what kind of water it is. Um, but um, um, at the time, at the in the beginning of the common era, um, the way in which one's place in the ocean could be understood was by seeing the color of the water, which is dependent on the vegetation that grows under the in under the ocean, or by looking at the sea snakes, or looking at the um, um, the kind of um, marine fish that were around. So these are all the qualities that made the uh, bodhisattva a very so, very much sought after navigator. And the Suparika Jataka then uh, talks about how the Bodhisattva then as a navigator, um, he takes this ship, uh, takes charge and navigates it uh, through storm and also through very rough seas. And I'll, I'll come to this again uh, in the next slide. And the third one, which I will not talk about um, is um, the, the context of conquest. It was not just that uh, people traveled for, um, you know, for trade or for making money or um, that religious teachers travel, but there's also a uh, mention of um, conquest. And in this case, it is a conquest, the Singhala Vijaya, a Prince Singhala who went to um, um, the Tamraparni, the Dweep, uh, Tamra Dweepa, uh, which is identified as Sri Lanka and, you know, took Buddhism there and how he, um, how he defeated the Ogreses. So there is the Singhala Vijaya, and it, uh, it's quite interesting if you see the, the depiction in the Ajanta paintings, uh, which shows Singhala taking his elephants on the ship and so on and so forth. But um, let me proceed and um, with uh, back to looking at the Suparika Jataka and the depiction of the ship. Now the passengers um, on this um, were uh, mainly merchants whom the Bodhisattva he guided. And you can see the Bodhisattva uh, in the front of the uh, ship. You can also see the, um, uh, the, the vessels, these uh, large pots um, that were placed in the front half of the ship, which I've highlighted um, by a circle. And um, these uh, pots were used for transporting commodities. Um, it was these huge pots. And these are the pots that we often find when archeological excavations are done at coastal sites. Many of these pots are found across the ocean. Uh, and the, uh, the Suparaka, the navigator or the Bodhisattva, you can see that he's praying to the Buddha. He has his hands folded because the ship has gone into stormy weather. Um, there, is, uh, the, the, there is a strong current, there are strong waves. Um, and so he, um, uh, he folds his hand and prays to the Buddha to save the ship and also to save the merchants. Um, so there are what what you have in this painting are several facets of um, seafaring which are depicted, not just the ship construction, which you can see on this, this the sails. The sails you often don't find uh, in underwater archaeology or in many depictions because it's usually the bottom of or the hull that's usually shown. Um, so uh, what one sees is uh, the ship construction, the dangers in sailing how commodities were transported, the passengers, um, and the uh, finally, of course, the fact that a, a smart or a wise navigator could save the ship and save the passengers. So what were the challenges? I have mentioned that uh, often it is said that um, India, uh, the coastline is very flat and there are not enough coastal markers on Indian shores. Uh, this um, this is a quote uh, from the, the first century uh, AD CE um, uh, Greek text, the Periplus Maris Eretria, or the Periplus of the Eretrian Sea, which I will talk in a moment. Um, it talks about the Gulf of Kutch, and it says that the land is hidden from view. And you can see this very clearly. If the ship is coming from the sea, it's very hard to find where the land is. Um, uh, unless one is very close and um, uh, and also because it says uh, because of the shallow eddies which reach a long way from land so that frequently the shore is nowhere in sight and the vessels often run aground and are destroyed. 
So these are major challenges um, to um, an unknown or uh, an untrained pilot um, approaching the Indian shores. And hence, uh, and this is again something which we hear again and again in Indian history. Um, um, you would possibly have heard of the pilot, the Indian pilot who led the Portuguese to the Indian coast. Um, the importance of local pilots, local uh, learning, uh, local fishermen. And here the Periplos talks about, um, this is the coast of um, Barigaza or Broch or Bharuch, Gulf of Cambay, which is again very volatile. The, um, the tides are very high. And it says that local fishermen in the King's service come out with crews of long ships. Um, and these um, uh, fishermen then guide uh, oncoming uh, vessels and guide them to the to the landing place, which is Barry Gaza or Bruch, Baruch. And these are these are ships that you see on Satvahana coin. So uh, there's a lot of information or um, evidence that consolidate that consolidates or establishes um, the importance of local pilots um, uh, in um, early seafaring and early navigation. Now let us look at this map. This map. Um, and uh, this uh, text, I just mentioned it, um, the Periplus of the Erythrean Sea. It's a very interesting text. It's written in Greek. Uh, it was written at the time of the Roman Empire, um, but the language is Greek, not, um, not Latin. And um, that's because Greek was the language of the traders, seafarers, travelers. Latin was a more a literate language. Uh, it is written by, and we don't know who wrote it, it's an anonymous writer. Now, what is interesting is that it starts from the Red Sea. It doesn't start from the Mediterranean. So it starts from the Red Sea and it talks about several uh, ports or coastal sites, Berenike being one and many others on this. And then it talks coming down um, at the mouth um, uh, of the Red Sea, it talks about two routes. One route goes to India across. The other route goes down the East African coast, down um, all the way down um, to Madagascar, down the East African coast. And then the Periplus says that the Indian uh, route was more profitable because you got more commodities there and uh, there was much um, sailing and movement uh, with the Indian coast. So the, the coast, uh, the route to the East African coast was not as profitable. So that is one. The second point that I would like you to notice, now you see these uh, blue dots. These are the places that the Periplus mentions. Uh, now there's a lot of blue dots that you see on the West coast, not that many um, on the Tamil coast. And then it kind of peters out and shows something um, in Bengal or what is today Bengal, what it calls Ganges. Um, now, um, certainly the emphasis was on the uh, West Coast, uh, but we also know, and this we know from our own sources, not the Greek sources, uh, but from our own sources, uh, that there were many routes across. There were all, many land routes which fed into these West Coast uh, centers. It's not just that, you know, that was all that there is. And, the, you know, the rest of India was, there's nothing there. It was all forested. That's not complete. That's not correct. Um, and we had a very a vibrant uh, economic activity uh, in peninsular India, um, in uh, North India at this time. But what is equally interesting, and this I would like you to take notice of, this, um, this red square that you see, that's the Persian Gulf. It's completely blank. So what does it mean? Does it mean there was nothing happening there in the Persian Gulf? Uh, why is it blank? We know archeologically that the Persian Gulf was very active at this time, had very close contacts with Gujarat and the West Coast. But uh, perhaps it was not of interest to the Greeks or it was not of interest to uh, the, the people traveling from the Red Sea um, to the Western Indian Ocean. Uh, but for some reason, uh, the Periplus leaves this um, as a blank and you don't see any of these, um, any of the, those blue markers uh, that we see on the west coast of India, uh, so densely on the west coast, I would say. 
Now, excavations have been done at many sites, and these excavations have really added to our knowledge um, about the movement and travel and seafaring activity um, in the first um, five to six centuries of the Common Era. And Berenike, where you can see that blue arrow, which shows you the site of Berenike on the west coast of the Red Sea. Um, that's a site which has been excavated by uh, many teams, many foreign teams, many Egyptian teams uh, over many seasons. So, so almost for about 20 seasons, it has been excavated. Also, what is quite interesting about the Berenike excavations is that because it's in the desert, um, because the climate is so dry, uh, a lot of organic material has been preserved. Normally, it's very difficult to find cloth or wood um, or food grains um, in, um, uh, you know, at Indian sites because it's so wet and because of the heat and, you know, because uh, of the warmth, uh, the organic material decays very fast. But in, the, in Egypt, in, an, in a desert environment, these have been preserved. And I must say to the to the credit of the teams excavating at Berenike, um, they have found a lot of foodstuffs. So large pots containing pepper from huge pots and several kilos of pepper uh, were found in large pots um, at Berenike. Another interesting find, very early uh, cloth, um, which um, uh, um, uh, textile experts have done work, and have argued that this cloth came from, uh, from India. Some of it was indigo dyed. Indigo as a dye was used. So we know that indigo was used. Uh, cloth came. Food items have been identified and fish. Um, again, um, it's very hard to identify fish bones um, and to identify marine fish or the use of fish at these coastal sites. But the excavations at Berenike have been able to do that. So um, uh, um, the point I'm making is that archaeologically, uh, 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 Berenike has been a very rich site, which has provided us a lot of information and a lot of data on various facets of, um, uh, of maritime travel, maritime activity uh, between the Red Sea and the, and the coasts of India but also between the Red Sea and um, uh, across the desert to the Nile and up the Nile uh, to the Mediterranean. Now, what is of interest to me here, um, and you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the time to discuss the excavations at Berenike, but if any of you, it, these are published, uh, and if any of you is interested, I would really request you to follow it up. These are fascinating excavations. Uh, which have given interesting um, uh, details of um, um, not just trade or trade items, but religion, um, uh, language, script, food items, textiles, um, uh, marine fish, coral, pearls, and so on. Um, so uh, uh, that's, that's a fascinating archaeological site. It dates for, it was sort of living and um, vibrant for about 800 years from third century BC to about 550 CE. So that's from what we would consider the Mauryan period to well past the Gupta period or, um, uh, you know, so it's really a site that extends for, or that is alive for about 800 years. But what I found very fascinating is um, these uh, shards of pottery or fragments of pots, uh, which were inscribed in 11 different languages. So even though Greek was the lingua franca, even though we often refer to trade between the Red Sea and India as Roman or Indo-Roman trade, uh, please remember that there were people speaking 11 different languages who were traveling. There are also Tamil inscribed Tamil uh, Brahmi uh, shards, which are um, written in uh, Prakrit and in Tamil, written in the Brahmi script. Uh, these comprise of names, um, and these are short inscriptions which have been found. So there is a lot of material from India. Um, there's the presence of um, uh, Prakrit, Tamil, Sanskrit, uh, Brahmi, the script, uh, pepper. Um, I've talked about textiles, but the fact that uh, people from all parts of the Indian Ocean uh, were trading and traveling at this point, and that is why these 11 different languages, 
but also the fact that we, if we look at religion, it was really a multi-religious milieu. And uh, we do know that there was, uh, I've talked about five or six religious structures, which have been excavated at the site of Berenike itself. Um, so there is a there is a, a, a sort of late Roman harbor temple, a temple um, uh, to the harbor, but also shrine of uh, different groups, uh, Palmyrans, the Isis temple. Um, there is also a Christian church. Now this again, um, I think needs some more work, some more research, Christianity, early Christianity, and we're not talking about the Portuguese uh, bringing Christianity. We're really talking about Christianity in the early centuries of the common era. So this is a fifth century Christian church um, at Berenike, uh, but the newest finds, and these have been, these are finds which were done, I think about two years ago, are the finds of Buddha images uh, and um, bilingual inscriptions at Berenike. Uh, so the point again that I've made earlier, that when we look at uh, seafaring activity, when we look at travel, we need to remember um, that it's not just a community, but many communities using several languages that traveled. And um, I will not have the time to talk more about the finds in the Persian Gulf and the South Arabian coast. I just want to talk about one site, uh, which is again, a World Heritage site, Khor Rori. Uh, in Oman, in the Sultanate of Oman. Um, it was known as Somuhuram. Uh, it's a large site excavated by the Italians. Um, and the reason why it's important, and you see that the, the pottery shard that you see at the top of the screen, um, which is inscribed um, in Prakrit and Brahmi, and there's also um, uh, inscriptions written in Brahmi, but in um, uh, Tamil, in the Tamil language. And there are many other finds that we see at Sumhuram. Um, uh, they, there has been a representation of ships. So we see these um, etched plaster with representations of a ship, um, very similar to what I showed you earlier. Um, the ships that you see on the coins of the Satvahanas who ruled in the Deccan all the way up to Andhra and uh, on the Eastern side and Karnataka um, Maharashtra, of course, and Karnataka on the Western side. Um, uh, again, fish vertebrae. And I also mentioned that it's very hard to find fish remains or fish bones and their use at archeological sites because it's not easy to identify. But here you find them uh, used in the same way as we find them used in Dwarka, in Beit Dwarka in Gujarat. And of course, at the bottom of your screen, you see this bronze uh, statuette um, from Sumhuram. Uh, again, this has come from India, and these bronze figurines are also known at Pompeii in, uh, uh, in Italy. Um, so bronze is again, bronze images are again uh, objects which traveled um, and, you know, are one of the many, many objects that traveled, and I really would not have time to talk about them. But let's come back to India. Let's come back to, this, to the question that I started with. So what are the coastal monuments, what are our coastal markers? I said that, you know, it's very, it, the, the coast is very flat and it's very hard to, um, to, to sort of see it if one is coming from the sea. Um, and what um, one uh, constantly um, finds is um, these coastal monuments which act as markers. So um, I'll start with, and I'll run through this very quickly. Uh, because there is just so much, there's no way I can give you uh, the entire uh, details, you know, starting from the second millennium BCE. And these are Iron Age burial sites. And please, this is Kerala, this is Trisur. These are Iron Age megalithic monuments. Uh, you know, these are the most endangered, whether they are in Kerala or in Tamil Nadu, they are all along the coast. Uh, nobody pays any attention to them. These are just, you know, huge um, stones which stand there. Um, but these are important uh, burial sites, um, uh, which I think um, need to be preserved better. Um, and of course, in addition to the Iron Age burial sites, you have monasteries, temples, churches, lighthouses, and so on. Uh, Gujarat has a, a whole range of coastal temples in several cl clusters. Uh, starting from uh, this, uh, from top of um, uh, Saurashtra, which is Dwarka here, all the way down 
Gulf, starting from the Gulf of Kutch, all the way down the coastal Saurashtra to the Gulf of Kambat, um, and um, the site that you see at the um, uh, at the head of the Gulf of Kambat. Um, these are all temples, um, very modest brick temples. Uh, again, many of them are in a sad state because of the salt and the the winds from the ocean. Um, and but um, they uh, they are really indicators of the communities who uh, both lived along the coast and traveled across the ocean. What is equally interesting is that many of these temples, um, and again, I think this needs uh, more attention. Many of these temples um, are uh, worshipped both by fishing communities, and you. Uh, this is um, uh, this is on a creek near Purbandar in Gujarat. Um, the temple is the Harshad Mata temple or the Harsiddhi Mata temple. Um, the temple is a goddess temple. It has many stories, stories of which connected to the fishing communities of the coast. You see these communities. Um, um, these are just along the coast at this end, uh, but the temple also uh, in its present condition dates uh, from the 1300s. There's a whole story about um, a merchant uh, who preserved this temple. So there are all these stories and narratives about these coastal temples, how they were resurrected, um, how they are uh, worshipped, um, and uh, how they connect, uh, not just to the inland communities, to the richer people, but also to the fishing villages. Tamil Nadu has its own set of stories, uh, only some of which I'm aware of. Um, and certainly I would be very happy if um, uh, any of your listeners could inform me much more about this. But coming back to these are these are excavations which were done by the Archaeological Survey of India, Kanchipuram district, coastal Siruvathur. Um, uh, it's a coastal Iron Age burial site. Dates um, from 300 to 600 uh, CE. So uh, from the Mauryan period to well across, you know, the same uh, range as what we talked about, Berenike. Um, this has almost about 500 burials. Kanchipuram district is so rich in burial sites. But again, a lot of these have been raised. You know, cities expand, cities don't care about heritage. Um, and uh, many of these, uh, what, is, what is fascinating is many of these uh, megaliths are very close to um, uh, temple sites. Two important sites, Mahabalipuram, you all know of, but um, uh, Saluvan Kuppam, I don't know if many people have visited the site. Um, it is six kilometers from Mahabalipuram. This was this was excavation which emerged after the tsunami. After the tsunami, this uh, this whole area was covered with sand, but. Uh, after the tsunami, part of the sand was removed and the inscription, there's a huge boulder at the site which has an inscription. So after the tsunami, the, ex the inscription was exposed and then the archaeological survey went in and excavated the site. And, um, you know, sure enough, there was this very beautiful temple, 4th to 14th century. Uh, the temple still stands and has been preserved by the ASI. But um, what is uh, what I would like to highlight about Mahabalipuram is several things. Um, uh, I'm sure you, uh, you've uh, heard in your earlier, um, uh, earlier lectures also about the Pallava Association and the Chola Association with Mahabalipuram. But this is the image of the Bhuvaraha, the boar incarnation of Vishnu, and how the boar incarnation um, brought or saved the earth from the waters of the seas, from the ocean, and brought the earth. And here you can see the boar um, um, going into the ocean and bringing, uh, uh, which is not represented here, but uh, that is the incarnation of Vishnu that uh, brings out or saves goddess earth or saves earth from the waters of the ocean. And there's a lot of symbolism there. Um, in uh, in the many avatars that Vishnu takes, which are associated with the waters, um, not just the Bhuvaraha avatar, but also the first one, which is the fish, the Matsya avatar, um, the um, uh, tortoise, the second avatar, the third is of course the Bhuvaraha. Uh, but you know, uh, there's there's a lot of um, narratives, a lot of stories, both in Sanskrit and in many other languages. Um, which talk about the way in which our ancestors are um, 
whose inheritance we have um, remains with us, conceptualized the waters. But as I have said, um, and this is something which pains me a great deal, is the fact that very little attention is paid to preserving our maritime heritage. This is a brick structure. Um, this is a brick structure which dates from the 10th and the 11th century. Uh, this is an older picture. As far as I know today, um, and I may be wrong, but today there is a railing around this. Uh, but why I find it so distressing is that this is very close to the wildlife sanctuary at um, Kodiakarai. Um, the wildlife sanctuary is protected, but cultural heritage is not protected, doesn't have the same strict laws as wildlife protection does. And this is a unique structure on the coast. Um, and I had talked about the fact that we have, um, because our coast is so flat and because of the fact, of course, that you know coastal communities were so active and vibrant in seafaring activity, there are many, many structures which came across only some of which we protect today. Um, this is on, at Tharangambadi, um, uh, further north of Pondicherry, what was earlier Trankabar, um, which is again a very rich fishing village. It was destroyed in the tsunami. Uh, but there are two, uh, two very interesting um, structures which still remain, the temple, uh, which is a Nayaka period temple, and of course this fort, uh, which is the only Danish trading um, uh, center here at, um, at um, Tarangambadi or Trankabar, and the first Protestant church was founded here. But let me move uh, on and uh, uh, go back to the point that I made earlier, that many of our temples are not just places to worship or places to, um, you know, for the deity or for ritual, which we have come to uh, regard them as, or, you know, in terms of architecture. These were, had a social, uh, you know, they had, they were important markers in our social life. They were part of our social and cultural life. And um, the, uh, th this is Mahabalipuram. And um, if you see at the top of, right at the back, um, there is the eighth century uh, temple, uh, which was used as a marker. There was uh, on the top of the structure, um, there was fire which was lit. And this was used as late as 1900, because it's only in the 19th century that the British built these lighthouses. And you see this lighthouse um, at uh, Mahabalipuram and the arrow shows you the older uh, temple structure, which still exists. Uh, so it just uh, it just corroborates the point that I made earlier uh, that these temples were not merely um, you know they they were certainly beautiful, certainly very well constructed, but there's a whole social and cultural context to these temples which we um, uh, need to bring in and which also uh, links them up with uh, the valuable uh, service that they provided to maritime communities um, and as coastal markers being just one of them. Um, and many of, and this is not, it's not only at Mahabalipuram, I can go and talk about many temples, um, both on the Kerala coast, also on the Tamil coast, uh, where you see lighthouses very close uh, to uh, the temples. Another aspect of maritime uh, heritage is our islands. India has more than 1300 islands. Of course, there are several uninhabited ones, uh, but the more important ones, uh, Kadheri, which is today a suburb of Bombay, nobody thinks of it as an island anymore. Uh, but uh, Bombay was certainly set more than seven islands and the seven islands came together to form the present city. Elephanta Island is again, a World Heritage Site known for tourism but it was also an important, um, um, should one say, an important landing place till the Portuguese came. Uh, but the islands um, on the Kanara coast, islands near Karwar on the Kanara coast, are the ones that I think um, are, uh, have a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of archaeological remains. In fact, the entire west coast um, the islands all along the west coast, uh, start, you know, from um, from Betwarka up Gujarat, right down to um, uh, to Karnataka, 
uh, to the Kanara coast. Um, these islands are very rich in archaeological remains. These are just, why were they fortified? These are, you know, these were fortified in the Vijayanagar Empire. And you still see the fortifications today. But I want to talk about two islands, um, you know, towards the last part uh, of my uh, lecture. And these two islands, um, I think I've already covered one hour. So I'll just quickly hurry up and uh, talk about these two islands. The two islands that I talk, that I would like to draw your attention to is Sakotra. This is at the mouth of the Red Sea. And um, this is Kanheri, uh, which is, I have just mentioned, uh, is a suburb of Bombay today. They are described and talked about in the first century uh, Greek text that I mentioned. Um, Sakotra is said to have been settled by Arabs, Indians, and Greeks. And you know, they are described in, um, in uh, the Periplus. Kanheri is also referred to. Kanheri, uh, most of you know, is, a, is a, an, an important Buddhist site. Today, it's in the middle of a reserved forest, but it was on an island. It's hard to imagine that it was an island uh, in Bom as Bombay suburb has grown today. But let's look at Sakotra. And why is Sakotra important? Um, I, certainly, it's an important strategic point off the coast of Yemen. Uh, there was a Christian church as well in the 6th century, in the 5th and 6th century. Uh, but um, what is quite fascinating is that there was a cave on this island. It was known as Hawk Cave. Um, it was visited, and you see the cave on your screen, uh, the mouth of the cave. Uh, this cave is a very deep cave. It's almost about two kilometers that you travel inside. Uh, and it's on the northern seashore of uh, Sakotra Island, whereas most of the landing places were on the southern side of Sakotra. Uh, so it's above sea level. The, the, it could be seen from the sea as ships approached, uh, but the cave itself is very deep. And it has been argued by people who have studied it, and this is a Belgian team and also a German team, uh, that this was a sanctuary, it was a shrine, it was not a trading settlement. And the reason why they argue that is twofold. One is they have found incense burners there. But the other fascinating aspect of this is the point that there are a large number of inscriptions, almost 200 inscriptions um, in this cave. These are written in the Brahmi script. These are short inscriptions. They are not very long inscriptions. Most of them talk about uh, the name of the person, where the person came from, his father's name, and um, that's, that's it. Uh, but the, the, the fact that almost about 192 inscriptions have been found in the Brahmi script um, on Sakotra Island in this cave is by its you know, is, um, is an important um, aspect of the number of people who visited this. These inscriptions, most of them I've said 192 are in Brahmi, but in many other scripts, Karoshti, which was used in Northwest India, Bactria, Greek, Palmyran, Aramaic, and Akshamite, and so on. Uh, they're not randomly placed. Um, this, is, this is a sort of um, a plan of that cave, and you see that it's very deep. And it is here, this is the far end of the cave. And most of these inscriptions are clustered here. Um, uh, and so clearly people who came here and it was not sort of um, that they just happened to be there and had nothing to do. And so they wrote their names much as we do on our monuments today, but uh, that they actually made an effort to get into this cave and travel to this cave. These two sites are very significant, sites five and six because here it is that you have these drawings, um, these ship drawings, uh, again, very similar to the ones we saw earlier. Um, the, the lotus petal, there are also South Arabian inscriptions. And I have said that there are incense burners that were found inside the cave, very close to where these are. These, uh, uh, um, the island of Sakotra itself, um, it was, um, uh, it's been described in the Periplus. It, um, it mentions that uh, people from different parts of the Indian Ocean, the Arabs, Indians, Greeks, they sailed out there to trade, they settled there. But the inscriptions tell us of the, the travelers, who were these, who left their names? 
Yes, we can imagine that they would have been uh, merchants, but what is interesting is teachers, Navika, sea captain, Niryamaka, captain, Shakas uh, from Western India, then a uh, gardener, a scribe, a Buddhist monk, a Yavana. Yavana is the term that is usually used in India for foreigners. It starts with, um, with uh, being used for Ionian Greeks, but then has um, you know, come to be replaced as Yavana. Kratrapas who ruled Western India. And the places, of course, most of the places that are mentioned are in Gujarat, uh, Broch, Bharukacha, Vidisha, um, and so on. There's also a Palmyron inscription, a tablet, and you see the tablet on your screen. Um, it is dated third century CE. And this tablet says very clearly that the God stays here. So it proves the fact that, you know, this was certainly a sanctuary um, and not a trading, uh, not a trading port or not a something that, you know, people just visited um, out of curiosity. The, uh, the links with, uh, with Gujarat between the island of Sakotra have continued. Kachi sailors and Dr. Chaya Goswami will talk more about this uh, tomorrow, I think. Uh, they still stop at uh, Sakotra on their way to, um, uh, to uh, East Africa. And uh, the reason why they stop and the reason why they stopped in antiquity was the fact that this, the island is located at a very, um, uh, a very, uh, should one say, a dangerous point of the journey because the entry to the Red Sea is very difficult. The winds uh, within the Red Sea and in the Indian Ocean are very different. And so negotiating that, uh, that stretch um, is very risky. And um, uh, even today, ships stop there. They offer ship models and seek the blessings of uh, Sikotar Mata. It's not clear whether the term Sikotar Mata comes from Sakotra or whether uh, it's the other way around. So we um, do not have information on that. Um, but we uh, do see um, these, um, these uh, folios or uh, these maps that are still used by Gujarati uh, uh, Dao um, captains. Um, and, um, as, and what is interesting about this is um, the kind of um, creeks and landing places that this, um, this map shows. It's not the map in the way in which we understand maps, but it's really looking at the Gulf of Kambat. And this is the Gulf of Kambat, which is a very dangerous gulf, as I mentioned earlier, and the different creeks and inlets into that Gulf of Kambat, each of which had a landing place, many of which had temples, um, a, a range of deities who were worshipped, um, and including many of these coastal temples were of uh, Sikotar Mata. This is a modern a 1981 uh, uh, wall hanging. Uh, but you still, um, uh, if one goes around that coast, one still finds um, these small temples uh, worshipped as Sikotar Mata. I just want to make one or two more points before I end. And uh, whoops, um, uh, the, um, um, I think the one point is political power and engagement with the seas. Um, I did not get time to talk much about it, but if you're interested, uh, do go to the Archaeological Museum in Goa and um, see these memorial stones of people who lost their lives um, uh, at sea. And I'm going to close now because I've already overshot my time. So summing up, I would say that uh, the spread of religions was very important. Um, and uh, we see the spread of several religions, um, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam by the sea roots, some of which we talk about, others we um, need more research. Uh, also, by the third to the 10th century, the whole network had extended from East Africa to China. The centrality of the islands remains, um, but um, is often disregarded. And again, uh, my last point, which I didn't get to talk about very much, are the, the, uh, the Tamil um, merchant guilds, or the, I mean, uh, they're known as the Tamil merchant guilds, had merchants from uh, large parts of peninsular India. I think Professor Subarayalu might talk about it. Um, and uh, But the, the one guild, and I draw this from Professor Subarayalu's work, was the guild called Anjuvanam. And this had merchants um, with diverse um, religious uh, 
affiliations. And I leave you with this. This is my final slide. And I leave you with this slide. This is a, a copper plate, um, a copper plate uh, from Kullam, um, Quilon, as it was earlier known, uh, dated 849 CE. And it, um, the, there are many things which this plate is important for, but the one point that I need to highlight and the one point that I um, brought this in for is the fact that the sixth plate is, uh, has signatures in Arabic, Pahlavi, used by the Persians, um, and a Judeo-Persian, which was used by the Jews and also traders uh, from Arabia. Um, and so Anjuvanam, uh, along with uh, the, uh, the other merchant guilds, the Ayaborle and the Manigramam, uh, were important guilds which traded both across the Western Indian Ocean and the Eastern Indian Ocean all the way to China. So with that, I close and thank you very much. Um, and I would be delighted to have any feedback that you might have. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Ray. Uh, I have a um, few questions that, you know, quite a few questions have actually uh, come from uh, the audience. I'm not sure I feel I have time for uh, covering all the questions, but I would like to at least ask some of the questions. Uh, there is a question from uh, uh, Anna Vergis. She wants to know what additional sources do we have about the shipmakers and social life of mariners of the Indian coast? Um, one of the major sources, um, uh, thanks Anna for that question. Uh, one of the major sources of this um, uh, would have been uh, underwater archaeology. Because um, if you look at the way in which Southeast Asian underwater archaeology has been done, there are almost about 100 ships that have been um, recovered. Um, and um, uh, details of, you know, cargoes, um, who traveled, um, you know, uh, depending on what kind of remains were found, um, it has been possible to reconstruct um, a lot of information that um, Anna is ar asking for. Unfortunately, this is not something that we have done in this country, and it remains neglected. So in the absence of information from underwater archaeology, our major source becomes anthropology or ethnography. And um, there have been um, um, the, um, and, uh, the Tamil University, Tanjavur, Mm. Uh, they had a whole project, I think a 20 years Nistas project, where they collected um, uh, poems or poetry or music um, of the shipbuilders and, you know, their stories. Um, so India is very rich in these kind of ethnographic details. Uh, several scholars have worked on this, um, and Nistas, uh, National Institute of Science, Technology and Development Studies in Delhi, uh, it had projects all over, um, uh, all over the country. Uh, where scholars uh, um, have worked, collected um, information from present communities, because in that sense, India is very rich. Um, it has, um, you know, it does provide uh, a wealth of information if we actually talk to the people who are involved in this. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, there is a question from Sivashankar Babu. It is interesting to see that Odisha ports are missed out in the periplus of the Eritrean Sea. Yeah. Was it a omission or it was not an active port at that time or, you know, that Odisha coastline? Thanks. Um, you know, um, and this is something which um, I, I thought I was trying to make the point, but maybe not so it didn't come out. Um, we write about uh, what is of importance to us. Mm. I mean, just as we do today, you know, right. I mean, when you read a newspaper, you read about your own city first. You don't read about what's happening somewhere else. Right. Uh, so um, why does um, the um, uh, the Periplos miss out the Persian Gulf? That's not important for the Greeks. Mm. Why does it miss out the East Coast? It's not that it was didn't exist. I mean, the East Coast was trading with Southeast Asia all this time. But it's not of importance to them. For them, it was largely the West Coast. Because remember, there's Sri Lanka. Now, how do you negotiate Sri Lanka? Do you go through the Gulf of Manar or do you go around Sri Lanka? Right. You know, so there's a whole lot of, a whole lot of, um, should one say, sailing questions 
or questions of um, uh, sailing ships which need to be addressed uh, mm. when we, you know, when the ships go, sailing ships go around um, uh, the tip and go to the East Coast. Um, so I would say that um, uh, our Indian sources are very rich on sources, uh, on, uh, on ports um, on the East Coast, but um, we, need to, we need to take the periplus um, as, a, as a text written by the Greeks, which talks about information which is of interest to the Greeks. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, there are many questions. I want to just pick some of them uh, in the next 10 minutes. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a question from uh, someone named Studio PP. I, I don't uh, know what his actual name is. Uh, was there a significant difference in the trade towards East and towards West? Can you elaborate a bit on the eastward maritime trade? Was it just as elaborate? Um, certainly there was a difference. I think there's a difference also in um, trade. Um, I mean, the east trade with Burma as opposed to trade with uh, Indonesia. Uh, because you can, you know, what is, what is in demand depends on what the local people want. I mean, you can't trade the same thing that you trade uh, to Berenike. Uh, pepper, um, you know, you trade it eastwards because pepper was required in uh, on the western side as you know as medicine, as spices. The Indonesians had their own spices, you know. Um, uh, so we are, you know, uh, what is being traded there is um, uh, textiles. Um, so certainly there is, uh, you know, there's a there's a difference in what we are trading. Um, right. eastward as compared to what we are trading westward and also in different parts of the coast. You know, I think that um, these broad generalizations need to be done away with and we need to really do micro studies and uh, look at, are we talking about Yemen? Are we talking about Oman? Are we talking about Arabia? Um, you know, a, a lot of, a lot, and let me say that a lot of trade uh, was also in uh, woods, metals, um, um, you know, uh, uh, pulses, there are pulses which are going eastward. Now, are they going for people of Indian origin? Are they going uh, for local consumption? You know, so there's a, there's a, there's a very marked difference um, in what is being traded and where it is being traded. Okay. Uh, a question from Srividya Jayakumar. Uh, who were the leaders of the Indian Ocean from 5th to 8th century? Uh, I assume later Cholas dominated, even Cholas only on one side, um, after their ascent, but would like to know a bit uh, before the Chola period, the 5th to 8th century. So is one, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, is it that who were the political dynasties? The Cholas were a political who, who, dynasty. Who ruled the oceans? I mean, who had control <laughs> over the oceans? Okay. So if you look at the inscriptions, just as you look at the Chola inscriptions, then look at the Sadvahana inscriptions. Uh, mm -hmm. The Sadvahana inscriptions, second century CE Nasik inscription of Gautami Putra Satakarni's mother uh, talks about her son as ruling, um, um, ruling the land as far as the three oceans. Okay. Right? What does that mean? You know, <laughs> so if I say, I, you know, I'm the owner of Delhi, uh, I'm saying it now it's, if I have the power, I make you believe it. Or, you know, if I don't have the power, you will say, ha, ah. you know. So these are the inscriptions of the kings. And starting from the Satvahanas, um, uh, whether you take the Ikshwakus, the Kadambas on the West Coast, um, or you take the Pallavas, for example, they're all talking about, in their inscriptions, they do talk about the ocean. They do talk about their, uh, their territory extending uh, until the ocean. And um, we have inscriptions also which talk about um, uh, particularly Kadamba inscriptions um, from the West Coast, from the Kanara Coast, mm. um, which talk about, um, you know, the Kadambas defeating their neighbors and establishing control. Um, so if you look at the, uh, if you look at the inscription starting from the Satvahanas, um, I think many Indian dynasties um, uh, sort of argued that they were the what did you what was the term you used? They were the um, uh, um, they were the emperors of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the other challenge is that um, uh, you know using ships for trading, mm -hmm. using ships and boats for fighting a sea battle, 
uh, or even uh, sending them to sort of uh, uh, you know safeguard your you know your trade uh, sure vessels so yeah. these are uh, these are fairly uh, you know uh, the, the these have how to what extent have they been documented right the, mm, very good point very good point um see the point um, like i said um the um if we if we move beyond our current thinking of the navy as hmm. the guardians of the seas right and a uh, warship being a specialized ship right right, right. Uh, right. Uh, to an to an earlier period uh, what we are looking at are uh, the same ships uh, carrying um, warriors and we know the tamil gales carried warriors we know you know we know from the memorial stones that i talked about uh, that there were people fighting sea battles uh, but the nature of ships as depend you know this is based on information that we have um was the same but the, it was not a warship i mean you can't you can't distinguish between a cargo ship a warship uh, a cruise ship the way in which we do today <laughs> it was the sh same ship which carried uh, warriors okay um, and the other point also is that many of the uh, many of the uh, communities uh, we know in southeast asia many of the nomadic communities you know who were typically um, nomadic um, warrior communities they were used by dynasties uh, to protect their kingdom so you know there's a whole ra ways in which okay uh, but the sh but we need we need far more information on ships i mean that we don't okay. have enough yeah we have about 4 minutes before uh, <laughs> okay. we have to move to the second uh, talk yeah uh, but i want to at least ask I mean, let me throw some of the questions and let's see how far we go. Uh, There's a question from uh, Manisha. Are there any prominent temples to Varuna, god of the waters, that have been found along the Indian coastline? Um, see, one of the problems with temples, and uh, this is true of the Gujarat temples, this is true also of um, uh, you know Mahabalipuram and many of the other temples. Mm -hmm. Mahabalipuram, what you have is uh, Sheshashai um, uh, Vishnu. Right. Right. Uh, you know, the earliest uh, structure at the site. The right. Gujarat temples don't have deities. And this is true of many temples that we don't have the deities um, today right. that were there at one point. So we have the structure, mm -hmm. but we don't have the deities. So okay. it's hard to say. But we have Varuna images um, and uh, CSM, the museum in Bombay, has a very beautiful Varuna image of the time of the uh, Chalukyas. It's a very beautiful uh, image. Okay. Uh, yeah. There's a question from Alkesh Zaveri. Would like to know more about Sikotarma, Gujarat coast. Uh, I assume he's not talking about Sokotra Islands or uh, Sokotra Caves that you talked about. Sikotarma. Yeah, that's the, that's the goddess. That's the deity. Ah, um, okay. Who is, yeah, who's worshipped, you know, uh, See, many of the deities, uh, 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 let me say two very broad things because I'm, you know, I'm running out of time. Yeah. One is that many of the, uh, many of the deities who are worshipped for protection are goddesses, right? Okay. And um, these goddesses often are shown seated on a ship or a boat. And Sikotar okay. Ma is also shown, uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, wall hanging that I showed okay. is also shown seated on a boat. Now, uh, we do have temples um, and uh, inscriptional evidence going back to about the 10th century from Gujarat, which mm -hmm. shows that the fishing communities worshipped her. Uh, the temples that exist today of Sikotarma are okay. all um, um, modern constructions. Now, uh, there are two ways of looking at this. One is to say that, oh, well, you know, these came up only, um, you know, 16th, 17th or whatever period. But right. the other point is that, you know, if you're worshipping in a temple, you don't worship in a dilapidated temple. Right. So, so you, they you just temples? abandon the temple and, uh, you know, sometimes... No, or renovate it or you renovate right. the temple. Right. So it's a new right. temple. Yeah, when you yeah. renovate, sometimes yeah. the primacy of a particular god may go away. And, exactly. Uh, exactly. Yes. Right. So there are there are uh, obvious challenges then. Yes. So I will ask one last question. I know we are just running out of time. Uh, there is, you know, we, we really have to talk a lot about. There's one excellent question which I want to uh, uh, present to you from Ramesh Babu. 
He says, has ASA or any other organization undertaken a comprehensive study of the hero stones strewn around our coast depicting the maritime history? I mean, I have seen a lot of hero stones which have depicted inland warfare. Yes. I myself not seen, with my limited understanding, uh, I have not seen anything which shows someone who died in the sea and that is represented in hero stones myself. Have you seen any of them or what is the hero stone connections that we know of with the ocean? Uh, there are, you know, the ones that I showed from Goa, uh, mm -hmm. those show people, I mean, uh, see the hero, uh, hero stone shows the hero alive, right? Right. Uh, you know, but, and the hero dies in a variety of ways and that's right. shown at Correct. the bottom. But the, 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 the ones that are linked to the sea, sea battles, show them on a ship. And, you know, the ones that I showed, which has uh, a, a person getting off and with a lance fighting the person on a ship. Uh, right. They are known, they are at Goa. They're also known, at, uh, are available at Aixar near Bombay. Uh, okay. Jean Deloche has done, uh, his, uh, his last name is Deloche, D-E-L-O-C-H-E. Okay. And his first name was uh, J-E-A-N, Jean Deloche. He's okay. done a lot of work on um, on hero stones and also on um, uh, boat depictions on temples. So I think there's there is quite a lot available, uh, but I think we need to we need to stop. I'm really yeah, sorry I know. for taking Thank so long. You. I mean, there are Thank many you. more questions, and I have my own questions which I just couldn't ask today. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much for an excellent uh, keynote address, uh, uh, Professor Himanshu Prabare, and you know we we have. We are really fortunate that you set the tone. As one of the uh, participants mentioned, there are 13 more lectures. And I'm sure we are going to keep getting similar questions, more questions. And yeah. thank you. Thank you for thank you uh, very much. Fantastic okay. lecture. Thank you. Uh, over to our uh, uh, host, uh, Mr. Kishore, uh, for Kishore Mahadevan for the next uh, session. Over to you, Kishore. Thank you, Padri. Hope I'm audible. Yes. Uh, so, uh, on, thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Himanshu Prabhare. That was an illuminating keynote address. Like Badri mentioned, there were several questions that uh, uh, we, we hope to have an interaction with you in future to, uh, to have some of those uh, additional questions uh, asked and clarified. Um, but uh, we will move on to our... Uh, so, so before we move on to our next, uh, uh, next lecture, uh, participants, you will see some of these themes that Dr. Himanshu Prabhare uh, spoke about in her lecture, you will see some of these themes, uh, you know, in, in some subsequent lectures, right? Uh, over the, uh, we have 13 more lectures. Uh, some of the themes that she touched upon in her keynote address, you will see that uh, in, in, our, uh, in our forthcoming lectures as well. So, so thank you very much. Uh, with that, we go to our uh, second lecture for the, for the day. Um, we are happy to welcome uh, Mr. K. R. A. Narsaya. Uh, Mr. Narsaya was born in Berhampur, Orissa, and had his early schooling in Tamil Nadu. In 1949, he joined the Indian Navy to do marine engineering course in INS Shivaji Lonavla. After completion, he sailed in naval vessels for 10 years and later joined the Merchant Navy. While in the Navy, he was deputed to MS Harland and Wolf Shipyard in Belfast to stand by construction of the INS Vikrant and also took over as its first in, as its Indian first flight deck chief. He joined the Vishakapatnam port in 1965 as a marine engineer and rose to the position of the chief mechanical engineer before retiring in 1991. While in port service, he was called back by the Indian Navy for Bangladesh liberation effort. After retirement, uh, Mr. Narsaya was appointed consultant to the Indian Ports Association. Later, he was invited by the World Bank to join a mission for the emergency rehabilitation of Cambodia. He completed the assignment in 1996. His, his visit to Angkor Wat induced in the interest in history in him. Writing and painting have been his hobbies, and he has written more than 100 short stories in Tamil, many of them having won awards. His stories have been brought out in three volumes. He has written a treatise on the Indian sea trade, which won him an award with the Tamil Nadu government. His book on the history of Madras also won the state award. One of his short story collections has also been awarded by the Tamil Nadu government. Another book on the history of Madurai was released last year. And this year, his book on Cambodian reminiscences has come out. 
Currently, he is working on the history of Trichy. He has contributed to the volumes that have been brought out in connection with the history of Madras. Along with historian Mr. S. Mutaya, he has written the 125 years history of the Madras port. Sri Narasaya's autobiography, Through the Rear View Mirror, was published in 2022. We now welcome Mr. Kiare Narasaya to talk on the world maritime history with special reference to India, where he will explore India's role in world maritime history going all the way back to the Greco-Roman times. Welcome, Mr. Narasaya. Thank you. Thank you, Kishore, for your nice uh, introduction. Thank you, Badri. Uh, shall we start with the screen share? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Today, we are talking about the world maritime history and with special reference to India. And actually, maritime history starts with sailings between Red Sea and Indian Ocean, the earliest time. And that is the earliest sailings known. And during the Pharaonic era, that is between 3000 years BC to 3000 BC, during this era, Egypt witnessed many aspects of progress and renaissance in all fields. In fact, uh, we all know Egypt is one of the forerunners for all the cultural activities, all the things that were happening around in the world. A pharaonic seaport was discovered in 1976. As late as that, earlier they did not know that pharaonic had a seaport even. Present-day site of Mursa of the basic devices seems to be having vestiges of a port. That was done only in 76 by some um, uh, uh, archaeologists. Large vessels were built in Coptos, that is in Coptos is a harbor in the Nile, were transported in ports and assembled here. They were built there, transported in ports, and here, I mean, what we do today in Japan, they say they uh, build ports in different places and come and assemble now. Shipper is more of an assembling factory than building factory today. You know? Likewise, they were already doing. And if you see this name, this is the port we are talking about, in which uh, this was discovered only in 1976. If you see the Red Sea, Red Sea happened to be the almost central part of all maritime activities in the world to start with. The Red Sea is about 2,300 kilometers long and varies in width from 30 kilometers at the Babel Mandop to 355 kilometers between the coasts of Eritrea and Saudi Arabia. This is a sort of a, a changing in shape. This is the Red Sea. This is the most important thing. And the Red Sea became the central part of all the marine activities then. That may be caused also because of the Nile, which was flowing nearby. The slow flowing Nile, one thing about Nile is Nile is not very fast like Brahmaputra or something, but that is slow flowing and it was ideal for transportation. From earliest times, Egyptians built boats for transportation. Remains of boats found at Abydos were about 25 meters long. You can imagine that on that time itself, they were building. Um, Boats are 25 meters long, two or three meters wide, and about 60 centimeters deep. And they will be seating about 30 rovers. Thick planks were lashed together by rope fed through the mortises. That is the same technology, whether it was in India or Egypt or elsewhere, building ship for plankings were joined together and lashed together, actually stitched. In fact, they say. In Telugu, they still say that they put on, you know, they stitch together planks. They don't join together with any other means. The seams between them were caught, caught with reeds. Now we are also caulking with uh, reeds so to avoid the water leakage. And you can see this is the Nile. So uh, Nile has been the central part of Egyptian everything, civilization, um, 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 growing, everything is depending on the Nile. 
Similarly, we had Indus in India. The earliest known, and the difference is the earliest known urban culture was in Indus area. Since the Indus Valley civilization saw the first urban civilization, though there were civilizations of different kinds, the urban type of civilization making a, a city, town with all the planned things were starting only then. That is about 2500 to 1700 BC. Though the southern sites may have lost it long, much longer after they were banished, the southern sites were still to be seen. So these are all the things as we know. We have found out from that areas and we know people lived, had some ideas and that script was being decoded and it's continues, continuing to be decoded now also. The earliest history of maritime thing becomes begins in the third millennium BC when inhabitants of the Indus Valley initiated maritime trade contact with Mesopotamia. There has been a very close contact between Mesopotamia and India from the early times. So culture also exchanged, everything exchanged between them. And the maritime history also starts in the third millennium, that is about 1500 years, I mean, 2300 years before today. We started, the Indians started the merchant uh, maritime trade between them. This we know because Indians were present in Alexandria and the foreign trades continued to live in India long after the fall of the Roman Empire also. The people used to wrongly think that it was only because of the Roman Empire we had sea trade. No, long before the Romans came, we had, we had sea trade. And long after Romans left, we continued with sea trade. That's an important point we must know. There was an interregnum of Romans coming and continuing with the trade. It is not as though only Romans started the sea trade with India. The Indian commercial connection with sea proved vital to the merchants of Arabia and Persia during 7th and 8th century most. And we go back to the periplus of the Eritrean Sea because that is the only recorded uh, statement of any sailor, though it is written only in the ordinary language of a sailor, it records all the important facts of sailing. And the text of this periplus derives from Byzantine 10th century manuscript in minuscule hand, kept in the University Library of Heidelberg, another of it dating from 14th or 15th century in the British Museum. This Copy edited by Sigmund Gallen. First of all, it was Sigmund Gallen who um, edited this from Prague and first published in modern edition in 1533, which was full of errors. It served for later editions. That was not um, very good, but it served as a basic material for later years, for later editions, for later uh, editors to start writing about it better. Until the rediscovery of 10th century Heidelberg manuscript, they found out another manuscript which was available in the Heidelberg, which is belonging to 10th century. It's a copied manuscript of the original Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. What is the time of this Periplus? Historical analysis published by Schaff in 1912 fixes the date of the text to 60 AD. You know, in history, nobody fixes any date to a particular year, they will always say to a decade or to a part of an year or something like that. But this gentleman shop fixed the date of Perplus as 60 AD. That is to one year he's fixed it. This is remarkable because this is nobody has done in any historic, historical analysis like this. And this was done in 1912. And Schaff's fixing the date to a single year is considered remarkable by modern standards. Because in 1912, what was the things that were available? Technology available was very poor, but even then he was able to fix it so clearly. All subsequent researchers have agreed the date to be 60 AD. Later on, whoever did any research, they agreed that is correct date. Schaff provides a historical analysis as to the text's original authorship as well. Schaff writes only as to how he feels this manuscript is important because it is an original text and its original authorship is available. That is what he is trying to prove. The, the periplus, the meaning of the periplus itself is showing guide, a guide. 
These days, ships people log everything. Those days, very few people were logging. It is the first logging of a sailor ever known, available today also in its original form. There are only 66 paragraphs in this. And this material describing ports starting from the Egyptian port of Musal Harbor. It ends with Bengal. It starts with Musal Harbor and comes all the way down the coast of India, right on the coast and goes right up to Bengal. That means you can imagine Red Sea, that is starting from Red Sea, coming all the way down from Red Sea, going to the uh, Indus ports, and then coming down the coast of Gujarat and Maharashtra and other places, Kerala, and rounding off at Cape Comorin and going up again. He went up to um, somewhere near uh, Pondicherry and beyond at that stop. But up to Bengal, he has noted it. Paragraph 38 onwards is all about Indian coast. And he identifies Indus River as Sindhus, which is the correct name actually. Sindhu is the original name also. So they have clearly written Sindhus as the name of the river. The route in Periplus is very important. You know, this is one thing which uh, even today as a sailor, I feel so excited about this particular map, you know, of Periplus route. You see, at that time, only Europe, Asia and Africa were known continents. Americas were not yet known. In the early centuries, Americas were not known. Australia was not at all known as a place. In much later, after all, in only 16th century, we come to know about America and uh, Australia and other places. Before that, world means only this much. In fact, uh, Pliny thought it is landlocked. It is there's anything beyond this sea. You can see in this Africa, Asia, and Europe. And what you see is a vast span of Indian Ocean that they called the Eritrean Sea those days. Actually, Eritrean Sea is Red Sea. There is a reason for Red Sea, name of the Red Sea, because those that sea itself, I have gone through Red Sea, but I have not seen the color of red, but they say earlier it used to have floating objects of red and things like that, so it was called red. In Rome, Eritrea, Eritrea means red. Even today, you know, we say erythromycin is red in color, you know. So Eritrea is anything red. And here, this Eritrean Sea was red, which was only during uh, this uh, area of uh, um, uh, between Alexandria and the Cape of uh, uh, Cape Horn of Africa. Um, Africa. Now, during this uh, Red Sea movement, they came all the way down and traveled upwards to Gujarat, Gujarat Kacheri actually, Kacheri. And you see all those dots, you know, mind you, this is all the ports mentioned here or mentioned in Eritre Eritrean Sea, Periplus. So all these ports were known to them. You can see it west, it's like a string of ports in the western coast. And it is right in the center, India's peninsular India is hanging into the sea. And so it can't escape the uh, sailor's sight either from west to east or east to west. It was right in the center and therefore India became more important for sailors. And now you can see in this clearer picture, you can see that it was uh, most important area in the Indian Ocean. And it was only in the first century that northeast monsoon and southwest monsoon were found out. They did not know before that there were this regularity was there. Though the regularity was there, nobody had actually correctly noticed it. It was only seen during this time, first century. And most important area is between zero, uh, that is equator, and 10 degrees north of. This, this ribbon is the place where maximum sailing was taking place. What are the ports mentioned in this uh, periplus? It starts with Mussel Harbor, which is shown here as Maya's Harbors. Bernike is also seen here. Bernike is named after the queen of the land, Bernice, and so it is called Bernike. You can see here clearly in the Red Sea, Mussel Harbor is this. Now, it is Maya's Ormus. And this is Bernike. 
these were the two important ports that were taking and that were doing all the necessary support for any maritime activities and it was connected to nile through land how did they come from alexandria here first of all for alexandria port as you see just one minute please. Sorry for the interruption. Just one minute. Uh, you can see here Alexandria to Juliopolis. Alexandria to Juliopolis. Juliopolis is a port in the Nile. Alexandria is a Red Sea port. It came, I mean, a Mediterranean port. From Alexandria to Juliopolis by uh, two miles by land road. Yes. No, you just click in the uh, middle of the correct. presentation. Yeah. yeah. So the Alexandria to Juliopolis is just this by land and Juliopolis to Coptos. Coptos is a port in the Nile. So this let's say place 333 miles. And it took 12 days by boat in this river. And they came up to Coptos. From Coptos, they either went to Myos Homos or to Bernike. So this is by land. And that is done through cameliers. Cameliers means those who possess camels for this trade. And what did Strabo say, who lived beyond the, I mean, during this time, 64 to 24? What he says, merchants of Alexandria are sailing with fleets by way of the Nile and the Arabian Gulf as far as India. These regions have become far better known to us of today than to our predecessors because of the sailors sailing from this way, Alexandria through Nile and to India. These places are known to us, he says. He says, Trabo says, I learned that as many as 120 vessels were sailing from Myers to India. You can imagine in the first century, 120 vessels sailing from one port to India. That means what kind of trade was going on then? What did Pliny the Elder say? This is an important thing we have to note from the Pliny's uh, statement. If the wind called Hippolus, that is Southwest Monsoon. Hippolus, it is called Hippolus because Hippolus was the Greek who found the periodicity of this particular um, uh, winds and recorded them as so and so. Happens to be blowing, it is possible to arrive in 40 days at the nearest market in India, Mosiri by name. Mosiri, as we know, it is now clear that it is the Patanam of today. Patanam of today was then known as Mosiri. Another port and much more convenient one is that which lies in the territory of the people called Nisinde, Barake, these two ports, that is Kotayam and Bakare. Barake is written for Bakare, actually, even today it is there. And Kotayam, uh, Nisinde is not exactly in Kotayam, but nearby, must have been. And here there is a very important thing, mind you, this is recorded in first century. Here, King Pondian used to reign dwelling at a considerable distance from the market in the interior at a city known as Madeira, that is Madura, Madurai today. That means it is so clearly recorded that in the first century, Pondians were ruling from Madurai, such a distant place from coast, the place in Musiri. They were commanding through the road, I mean, through the land, 
such as on this just imagine we are talking about first century and important para in the plane is this thing i found most important was travelers set sail from india on their return to europe at the beginning of the egyptian month type year which is our december or at all events before the sixth day of egyptian month meshit the same as our january they do this they can go and return in the same year mind you this very important statement he is talking about two months type year and meshit type year in december meshit which is after december that is in about um, uh, january just look at the closeness of our months tamil months tai and masi exactly 15 days apart tai and tabi tai bia and meshet and masi so it is exactly the same thing which i argued once long before that is about 15 years ago that this is why the term tai pirandal bhavi perakkum in tamil came to be because the month of tai the, the, the sea route is thrown up for sailors though we will say that because because of that so many things may happen romans initiated voyages from egypt to india and alexandria became the greatest commercial center of the world and it was so greatest commercial center was alexandria and that was a central point for everything it was a leading emporium for the aroma aromatic and pungent spices of india the markets of greece and the roman empire they found that a ship load of these things taken from india aromat aroma think and pungent spices will fetch them in many many times more than what they spent for going to sail uh, going by sea to uh, india and coming back so naturally they were becoming richer by just one trip itself roman trade with india was extensive for more than 3 centuries and then began to decline reviving somewhat in the 5th century ad but declining again to 6 this is a very important historically roman trade with india was extensive for more than 3 centuries as i said earlier but that doesn't mean indian trade was less indian trade was going on through and through but roman trade reduced after 3 reviving somewhat in the 5th century ad but declining again in the 6th century <coughs> a pontiac inscription that is very important historical evidence is in 1999 to 2003 the university of southampton conducted excavation at the site of koyser al qadim today what is known as koyser al qadim prompted by the idea that the site was not the minor port of yokos layman as thought by previous writers from the university of chicago but the important site of mayas corpus now they said koyser ali kadam is was mayas corpus and therefore we must excavate in the area and do more archaeological find out more archaeological evidence and what they found one of the thing they found was a pot shed a portion with the tamil brahmi writing here in this place what is written there in tamil brahmi is ponai puri that means a pot suspended in puri so this i had led the extensive discussion with airav the mahadevan who is actually who was the first one to identify this letter and tell them that it is ponai puri and he was also explaining to me how that must have gone there in the ships you know people used to hang things in ponai puri and they one of the ship might have been wrecked there and one of the sailors must have um, had it with him and this was the thing which is now found so you can see this is a solid evidence to show that uh, our people were present in alexandria long before what we thought they were the fourth paragraph in this periplus starts with this below the ptolemies of the huns at a distance of about 3000 stadia there is odulis that is he is talking about red sea ports they used to formerly to anchor at the very head of the bay by an island called diodorus east of hoa hoa is on of africa on of africa as you know that is the western and eastern part of africa 
Now you see the picture very clearly. If you see, you can see. This is Diodorus. This is Diodorus Island. It is even today there. People, sailors like us have seen that. And when they they come down here, and Diodorus was one of the important islands for them to take rest or flourish with something, whatever it is. And that particular Diodorus, today what is called Socotra, it is called Socotra. Actually, Socotra, they say, is a derivation from Sanskrit word Sukhadara. Sukhadara means on the way, some nice place to rest. So this was the place where rest could be, uh, my sailors could rest for a while. They had the longest caves. In fact, in the world, the longest caves are available in this um, uh, particular place. And uh, there, there is, is now Socotra. Huntingford remarks, J.W.G. Huntingford, uh, who analyzed everything with the purpose of 1503, he says Socotra derives from the Sanskrit Sukhadara, island of bliss. In 2001, as late as 2001, a group of Belgian speleologists, speleologists are the specialists to study caves of the Socotra Coast project made a spectacular discovery. They were all mostly from Sweden, Belgian speleologists. Deep inside a huge cave, they came across a large number of inscriptions deep inside the cave. The cave itself is about eight kilometers long. In that, they found a large number of inscriptions, drawings, and archaeological objects which were left by sailors who visited the island between the 1st century BC and the 6th century AD. What is the importance of this message, especially to India, is the most convincing theory, convincing point to show that Indians have been sailing long before anybody else sailed. And these paleologists have recorded all the inscriptions there. Majority of the text is written in the Indian Brahmi and one in Karashi script. So mostly Indian sailors, whether they went from South India or Gujarat or wherever it is, that is different, but it is Indian sail. Dr. Indro Strauch, from Lausanne University in Switzerland, he says, we found in January 2006, an inscription in Karosti, another Indian script, which was used only in the Northwest ancient India, that is the modern Pakistan and in Central Asia. That was a script used there. Professor Swaminathan has talked about it once about Karosti script, I remember that this was very well used those days. The whole corpus of Indian inscriptions found in the Hawk Cave is an impressive witness of Socotra's cultural past. What is that the Indian inscriptions you find there? From the texts written in several handwritings, how they are written? They are written by ordinary stones on the um, rock, you know, deeply scratching, or sometimes with charcoal, sometimes with something, but fortunately, because they were caves and well protected, none of them got uh, destroyed or obliterated and they were all available for researchers to see. From the text in, um, written in several handwriting, we get a unique picture of the art of writing as practiced not by specialists, art of writing not by specialists, by many uh, ordinary people and many Indian religious inscription, but by ordinary people, very, very ordinary people, so they are sailors. Ingo Strauch and Hawk Cave, what he says, he's a professor of Sanskrit and Buddhist studies in Lausanne University. He talks about the cave, which is 10 kilometers long and has 193 inscript Indian epigraphs written by 117 different persons. See the trouble he has taken. He has collected the corpus of all the inscriptions and classified them and says, 193 Indian epigraphs written by 117 different persons. So many people have been going there. One Ravak, Ravahaka has written the most. Ravahaka is the name of a person. We don't know where is he from. But from the name, it sounds he is from that Sindh area. 
except one in Karushi, there is store in Western Brahmi script from Western India. That's what this uh, gentleman has found out. And then the, in the uh, Periplus, we see it talks about Sindhus, that is Indus River. He says the river Sindhus, the greatest of all the rivers that flow into the Eritrean Sea, bring down an enormous volume of water so that long way out at sea, before reaching this country, the water of the ocean is fresh. This is an important point. As a sailor, I would like to just share my experience with you at this point. When we were in steam vessels, we were always short of fresh water. And uh, I was sailing in Liberty vessels over the most horrible ships. They never had water also. And their operators will never work properly. So what we used to do is when we go near Calcutta, we will anchor off sandheads and we will wait for low tide. When low tide goes, Ganges River will flow into the sea. You will be surprised to see that for more than 8 to 10 kilometers long, a shaft of fresh water will be going into the sea. And with our general pump, general water services pump, we take the water from sea, which is fresh water. Mind you, fresh water, a shaft of fresh water surrounded by sea water. This is a phenomenon in all the places where uh, uh, rivers with uh, 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 waters flowing very fast, they can go to very long distance keeping their identity. So this uh, water they can take in the ships when they want to use. The river has seven mouths, he says, very shallow and marshy so that they are not navigable. But unfortunately, they are not navigable except the one in the middle at which by the shore is the market town, Barbaricum. But Barbaricum was an ancient seaport near today's Karachi. Beyond the Gulf of Baraka is that of Barigasa and the coast of the country of Taraika, which is the beginning of the kingdom of Nambanus and of all India. That's what he talks about. We'll see what, the, what he means. The coast is called Saira Stream. He, what Sairastrin here means is Saurashtra. It is a fertile country. That is a sailor says. Sairastrin is a modern Saurashtra coast. So some name they have got, but they have used this. Now we have to talk about uh, the paperage document available in Vienna. As you all know, Vienna has got the largest corpus of paperage documents available in the world. And they are maintaining all the papers documents. And there was an important papers document which relates to Indian trade. A document discovered in Egypt in 1980 and first published in 1985 known as the Musiris Papyrus. It was found in Egypt. Mind you, this document was found in Egypt and it is identified as Musiris Papyrus. That is, a, a document from Musiri. Musiri is today's Patna. It is now also preserved in Vienna. This paper is document mentions a loan agreement made by the Egyptian merchant and a merchant in the Musiris for exporting. Can you imagine in first century, a contract was drawn, a proper document was produced and a loan agreement was made by an Egyptian merchant and a merchant in the Musiris. How did it remain? How did they not get destroyed? The reason is, it was a loan from Egyptian government and the document was submitted to Egyptian government. And that is why it survived. So you can see, 2000 years before, what all we are trying to say, we have modern uh, management system, they're all happening then itself. And a better system, and they were maintained. This paper state, state, uh, uh, a document is available. It also estimates the value of goods and a 25% tax for the items at that point of time. What is the value of the goods and what is the tax available for it for the government? That is, Egyptian government was levying a custom on these uh, goods that were brought from India. That Egyptian merchant gave this agreement to the Roman government as a guarantee for a loan. Mind you, this is a very important para. Egyptian merchant gave this agreement to the Roman government as a guarantee for a law, and that is how this agreement has survived through the ages. Can you imagine? This is in first century we are talking about, and that is available today also in Vienna Paper, paper Museum. Stephen Sidebotham, fortunately, I had a 
close connection with Said Gautam and I was in contact with him. I've also, in fact, I, I once invited him also. He said he was coming, but then he couldn't make it. Stephen Said Gautam did a lot of research. When I was writing my book on Metros, I had some doubts and uh, I contacted Sa Stephen Said Gautam then and he was helping me so much. And so later on, I was able to meet with him and do it. And he was very close to our Dinamalar um, uh, 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 editor also, that is... Krishnamurti. Yeah, that is correct. He was uh, very close to him because he also went for this, uh, some of this thing. And this is the document available there, the Papers document. And side both of them is seen in this place. And some evidences to show that ships were moving. The co directors of excavation at Bernicke, Dr. Stephen Sidebotham, a historian at the University of Delaware, and Dr. Willick Pendridge, an archaeologist at the University of California at Los Angeles, say that the research showed that the maritime trade route between India and Egypt in antiquity, this is an important point he makes appeared to be even more productive and lasted longer than scholars had thought. Also, it was not an overwhelmingly Roman enterprise, as had been generally assumed. People assumed that it was all only Romans who were doing the trade. No, the artifacts at the site indicated that the ship might have been built in India and were probably crewed by Indians. So the ships were built in India and crewed by men Indian sailors and were probably going there. And Dr. Vendrick says, we talk today about the globalism as if it were the latest thing, but the trade was going on in antiquity at a scale and scope that is truly impressive, he says. What are the commercial aspects? Said Botham's book throws some light on the trade aspect as well. Ptolemaic documents suggest that after the expenses, the skipper got 50% of the profit and that is how such hazardous trips are undertaken by the masters. They were getting 50% of the profit. Vienna's papers document contract says cargo cost was 6.93 million drachmas. That's a fantastic amount in those days itself. 6.93 million drachmas, almost 7 million drachmas. And 50% of the profit was going to the master, so the master was willing to take any uh, risk. And what was the <laughs> cargo? You'll be surprised to know it was Gangetic nerd, what we call vetiver in Tamil. The cargo was Gangetic nerd, used for flavoring wine, wine, anointing the dead, for perfumes, cooking, etc. Ivory and fabric on board a ship. Even the ship's name is available, Hermopolo from Musiris. So much records were available now. Contract drawn at Musiris. This contract was drawn at Musiris. El Carson says from the contract, if we take the word Kata Musirin to mean for a voyage, Kata Musirin means a voyage from Musiri. As Thul suggests, one of the men suggests, the original contract was drawn up at Musiris, either Ego or Thu. Two people's name, you go with one, two is one. Both may well have been the members of the foreign colony resident here. The Sangam literature also says that there were Romans resident, residing in our ports for, for long times. So there were th these merchants might have been Roman merchant in, uh, uh, in uh, Musiri and Roman merchant in Egypt. So it could have been like that also. So extract from para 949, if you see, they are imported into this market town, wine, Italian preferred, wine always Italian preferred wine. Our kings were so luxurious. They were always favoring wine and all that. So our call came also, copper, tin and lead, etc. And for the king brought very costly vessels of silver, singing boys, beautiful maidens, and for the harem, and for fine wines. These were all brought by the traders. You can see that it was done in first century. That is, the, our Indian kings were living in such luxury, they needed all these things, beautiful maidens and queens. And that 
Sangam literature also proves it is to be correct. That is in Purana Nuru, there is one uh, this thing which clearly says, Yamanar Nankalam Tanta Tan Kamal Teral. Teral is wine. Yavanar means they, these uh, uh, Romans. Nankalam, beautiful uh, pots. They brought the beautifully smelling Tan Kamal Teral. Ponsai Punai Kalanti, not ordinary vessels, but in golden vessels. Mundudi Mahalir, all beautiful maidens were serving it to the kings. This is what they were doing. This is what Purana Nuru says. And you know why our, uh, they lost all our country because of this kind of luxury living by the kings. Beyond this, there is another place called Kumari, that is Cape, at which for the Cape of Kumari and Harbour. Hither come those men who wish to consecrate themselves for the rest of their lives and bathe and dwell in, the cel in celibacy. And women also do the same, for it is told that a goddess once dwelt here and bathed. All these things I prove, these are all recorded in Mani Meghalai. And Mani Meghalai is written three centuries after Eritrean Sea was written. You can imagine now from that the continuity of things that was available by word of mouth, people telling everything. And that story is true that uh, uh, a, a lady was sent from Kasi because she made a, a false uh, a claim against her brother in law. And that was proved to be wrong, and that poor brother in law lost his life because he was beheaded. After that, she agreed, she made a mistake. So, for her, she was told to go to Kumari and uh, do penance there. So, when she came there, did that, all that story is there. But Mani Meghalaya also confirms this. Tamil rules the eastern seaboard also. Much later, also, Tamil ruled the seaboard. Somebody was selling a little earlier. And I'm just confirming that. So entire area, entire area of the sea that was lying between uh, this coast and eastern bed, this big sea it was all ruled by Tamil sailors. Emperors Rajaraja Chola and Rajendra Chola extended the Chola kingdom towards the east. They extended the Chola kingdom, but mind you. Original history, if we read very closely, it was not done for the sake of extension. It was done for the sake of protecting their merchantmen going through the Moroccan Strait. <coughs> Even now, Moroccan Strait is called one of the marine choke points. There are three or four marine choke points today in the world. One is Moroccan Strait, another is Suez Canal, third is Panama Canal, and one or two more straits. They are the choke points through which considerable amount of shipping activities take place. Now, for instance, between India and China, almost 40% of trade is going through the Moroccan Strait. So if somebody chooses to close the Moroccan Strait, finish our trade is over, merchant trade is over. And so that is why it is called marine choke points. So something must have happened there because Sri Vijay was living in that area. Sri Vijay was ruling then there. And Chola, why Chola should go and um, uh, invade on Sri Vijay was my own assumption by going through that is the merchantmen of Tamil sailors must have been attacked by those people. To protect them, the Rajendra Chola brought in this uh, navy and moved there. And uh, Rajendra Chola was the first one to train sailors and put them to sea. Even today, of course, it is not there now, but the training ship for the merchant marine officers were called, was called Rajendra in Bombay. It was a floating ship named Rajendra to honor this king Rajendra. Not many people know it also. Because many people come and say that they named Dr. Rajendra Prasadin. That is the problem with us, you know. Except that the Chola kingdom towards the east. Chola navies invaded and conquered Sri Vijaya 7th to 7th, 13th century in the Malaya archipelago. Cholas extended their influence to China and Southeast Asia, and by the end of the 9th century, had developed extensive maritime and commercial activity in Eastern Bed. Too much, actually. In fact, uh, our uh, uh, trade merchant guilds were available all over the East. Cholas in 11th century 
see it twice in the regions under them the cholas conquered many countries due to their strong navy and they established their area and this is the route they took and they established the entire route many harbors and many merchant guilds were stationed there and so it became actual strong points of rest for sailors of rajendra cholas expedition annexed during his overseas conquest sri lanka maldives and the manikobar islands and parts of malay peninsula indonesian archipelago archipelago through conquest through conquest of the sri vijaya empire cholas secured the sea trade through to china so the china the chinese sea trade became very very important for this now merchant guilds of southern india form the merchants of southern india form trade guilds what is called today as uh, chambers merchant chambers in order to organize and expand their trading activities it's an important event which which has to be considered most important for all the activities that was taken by sea trade or whatever it was trade guilds became channels through which indian culture got exported to other lands as well because they were stationed there they were stationed there though from 11th century to 13th century uh, through from 11th century to 13th century south indian trade in southeast asia was dominated by the cholas and pallavas in the previous centuries the guilds not under the control of government of the day never the guilds were coming under the control of the government they were on their own they were no control by the government at all what are the merchant guilds known as one was anjuvannam second was padinen vishayathar padinen vishayathar 18 people joined together 18 group joined together manigramam ainutruvar that is 500 people nana desis that is people comprising from different countries nana desis these were the some trade guilds there were some more also they helped the foreigners actually in nagapatnam there existed a brick tower we all know now it's not there the danish people demolished it brick tower called chinese pagoda pagoda this was demolished by a jesuit mission in 1867 there were some chinese traders interacting with tamil merchants here and they were allowed to have their own pagoda and it was built by um, uh, the same our uh, trade guilds and this was uh, this is not there anymore this is a picture from the archaeology department there were some buddhist relics which were taken away by art enthusiasts from this place when this was demolished and the image of buddha was there in the pedestal of an image of buddha there were some letters they were found some letters and they did not know what it was later they found it is to be tamil script these were exhibited in tokyo in 1992 as collection of mr and mrs rockfeller it was established that this artifacts were from nagapatnam these were the artifacts and they were these are the tamil writings in the pedestal it was in tamil uh, ordinary writing but i will like and what were the trade guilds and where were they established one the oldest of trade guilds that we see it has left a, a sign of having been there it is belonging to third or fourth century in thailand that is one stone written on it in tamil bhumi perum patan kal perum patan kal the great the big uh, smith's stone goldsmith must be second is takupa the ninth century i will show you now first is here that is oldest in thailand in perum patan kal second is in takupa belonging to 9th century and mani mani gramathar built a tank there for the local people. mind you they came for trade but they helped the trade, uh, local people by building a tank for them and uh, that is mani gramathar they did and third is in uh, this place see tamrit play gift to brahmanas by dharma sanmat dharma senapati was a chief merchant he had gifted to brahmanas some areas brahmadev and that is recorded there that is available there 
And next we see in Tamar, that is Vishnu Temple Hall. I mean, sorry, Dharma um, Senapati. Then next is Vishnu Temple Hall. And last is Vanshu, which is the most important thing of it, 13th century. It belongs to 13th century. So there are five inscriptions here. Starting from oldest third century Pirmbatankal in Pagan. And you see you now the range of the uh, South Indian trade. We found a stone, a Pane, um, uh, Uri, Pane Uri, which is much earlier also in West. And we find not very much removed from that time in the East, within the next third or um, three or four centuries in Pagan Pirmbatankal. That means the range of Tamil merchants was so vast. What happened to all those things later? We have no idea. This is the goldsmith Perum Patankal. It is in Thailand Museum. It is written Perum Patankal. Here it is written Perum Patankal. Last is Kal. Found in Krabi province, Thailand. Now kept in Krong Tampra crew or some museum Krabi. In Tamil Brahmi, written Perum Patankal. And Kwanshu is the most important thing, which was only 13th century, which was found out by one Subramanyam in first uh, beginning of last uh, century, 20th century. But earlier it was found, but they did not know what it meant because they did not know what language was written here, though there was a uh, Chinese script at the bottom. Chinese script is also at the bottom. But the Tamil script, they did not know it was Tamil. It was on Subramanyam who found out in the beginning of the last century that it is Tamil script. And what is written there in Tamil? The first line says, Hara Swasti Sri Savaptum 1203. That is, we have to add 79 years to get to our uh, year count. So 1203. In uh, that means 1281 year in our Roman calendar. That is turned in 13th century. Chitrai, that is Chitrai, you know. Chitra star. Chitrai, no, Sri Saikakan Tirumenik. See, Saikakan Tirumenik, I will explain this. Nandrahu Udayar, Tiru Kanishar, Mudaya Nayanare. Eri Arula Paninar, Samanda Pirmal, Ana Tavachakrivati. Saika Khan Parmona Pedi. See this. He is given a date. He is given a date, Stop Chitra. Why did he who for whom he did he, he erected this, this temple? This is a temple for Shiva. Saika Khan, who is the son of Kublai Khan, was ruling then. Saika Khan gave that area to this uh, merchant. So that merchants erected a temple, Shiva temple and called that idol as Tirukkan Ishwar. So everywhere, now there is one uh, Shiva temple in Calcutta High Court. It is called High Court Ishwar. You know, mm. it's given the name High Court Ishwar like that. This guy has given the name Tirukkan Ishwar. Khan Ishwar. Eri Arula Paninar, who Samanda Permal, Tavachakratigal. Samanda Permal, his name is Samanda Permal, is also known as Tavachakratigal. How Saika Khan Parman Padi. Parman means Firman. Firman means his uh, command. So according to that, because he gave the land everything, he has done this. And that is available even today. And uh, remains of the temple is also seen. Merchants of Southern India formed trade guilds in order to organize and expand their trading activities. Trade guilds became channels through which Indian culture got exported to other lands. From the 11th century to 13th century, South Indian trade in Southeast Asia was dominated by the Cholas and Pallavas are in the previous uh, in the previous centuries. But Pallavas, we don't find much this thing like Cholas. And we also find not much from Pandavas time, but it is Cholas time, only maximum evidence is available. And none of these merchant guilds were under the control of the government of the day. They were doing by themselves. Even here in uh, Madras, when I was uh, doing some research for Madras study book, there is a temple in uh, North Madras. In that temple, there is a stone found. 
in that stone it is written a merchant guild has given some amount for mailapur temple to be maintained for a lamp you know so that means these merchant guilds were supporting the temples temples wherever they were you know it is not as though they were uh, reduced to only their own land but no wherever they were they were doing by themselves it was not by government at all so government need not take over the temple what i mean is that without every taking over by government our temples could have performed better also we do not know mariners and merchants control the trade the trade was controlled by mariners and merchants of the and not by the kings of the day the trade and transport were on the professionals as the government was only a facilitator supervisor and safe voyage keeper so so in the port it was government responsibility to maintain a watch on the cargo that arrived it it was done even in mailapur mailapur it was called eripattam any port that had a protection value through this system it was called an eripattam so mailapur also became an eripattam because that was protected well that is the cargo can be brought ashore and kept without fear of being stolen so the government was facilitator supervisor and safety care, safe cargo keeper we can see this from patinapalai madurai kanji and other madurai kanji and other sangam literature also this is explained the government collected customs due and provided security that's all like in madurai kanji patinapalai we see polipurithu 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 puram okay that is puram chen puli perithu means uh, the stamp of cholas so we are talking about single window system today that was available even then that is as the cargo came immediately they were inspected customs um, uh, inspected puli perithu puram nek nokki that means they will give a stamp for that uh, king that is tiger and things will go and they have collected the customs due and provided security government for the security merchants guild collected the fees and supported the government merchant guilds were also collecting the fees and supporting why sea route came later important all from the early days we had the sea route but sometime in between the sea route was completely forgotten and again only in the side we find in uh, 16th and 17th century the sea routes coming more important what was the return in the middle ages the spice trade from india and the silk road from china were backbones of the economy that is why sea trade had come down when constantinople fell in 1453 this route was disrupted disrupted there was no more going silk route was disrupted when the silk trade was disrupted europeans had to find a sea route so they had to find some other way then they started the sea route earlier what was known but forgotten for almost 5 centuries Portuguese explored and Bartholomew Dias discovered the Cape of Good Hope in 1488. Cape of Good Hope was discovered in 1488, that is 15th century end only, and Bartholomew Dias did this. After that, in fact, uh, he called Cape of Good Hope as Cape of uh, Storms. Actually, his ship was stormed into that. Later on, became the name changed to Cape of Good Hope. and vasco da gama discovered the route to india and landed in calicut in 1498 and christopher columbus discovered american coast i used to joke always christopher columbus should be given a management award because he went to a place without knowing what it was he sailed west to find east and he landed in a place without knowing what it was and named it after a country which it was not so he used to be given a management specialist award i used to say thus the period is called age of discovery from age of discovery it start when the age of when the age of discovery started there was a fight between spaniards and portuguese both were wanting to uh, uh, take the trade route so they went to the common judge that is pope so a papal bull was issued to pope alexander 6 So mind you, but we are talking about land grab. But all today was there. They know only that land, the sea, or countries didn't belong to Pope, but he gave anyway. A purple bull issued by the Pope Alexander VI granted to Spain 
all lands to the west and south of a pole to pole line, 100 leagues west and south of any of the islands of Azores. I will show you now in the morning. Thus, the world was divided between Spain and Portugal for trade. And Portuguese explored the east and Spain went west. And that's where we find Spanish culture all over. This is the Azores Island. This is Azores Island. And Pope drew the line like this. Pope drew the line and called it all this side of this is for Portuguese, on this side of his first part. That's why we have Spanish culture here through and Portuguese culture in the other areas. The search for trade roads persisted. Ferdinand Magellan went out. Of course, he was killed in the Philippines and of the five vessels under his command, only one returned. The Victoria returned triumphantly to Spain with a cargo of spices. That is the first time the West knew about spices available in the East, then started the trade. This is a frame of Ferdinand Magellan's route, how he came back to Spain. The age of discovery in 16th century started. First, they started like this and went from here, came to Kirempo. It was Bartholomew Adias who found out this route and then to uh, this thing. And Vasco da Gama, the, the uh, became the entry port for the Westerners in India. And 20th May 1498, Vasco da Gama arrived in Calicut and was received by Zomri. And the world was never the same again. And that started with the origin of trading companies from west to east. And the East Indian spice trade was a monopoly of Spain. This gave an opportunity for English to venture after Armada. The company conducted separate voyages until 1657, when a permanent joint stock was raised with just a different story altogether. The company met with opposition from the Dutch, Indonesia, and Portuguese. The company won trading concession for the Mughal Empire, that is, when Shajagan was there. Colonial era started on 22nd August 1639, Fogonan Day, two merchants of the East India Company signed an agreement to set up a factory in Madras and were offered a piece of land 500 yards long in the coast where the Kuvum flows into the sea by Damarla Nayak, who was in charge of the area. The English thus entered India and soon, soon spread themselves across the India. There was no stopping. And thank you very much. That comes to the end of my presentation, Patri. I hope. <laughs> I have done something. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, sir. It was really wonderful. I mean, there was the first talk had covered some of these points, uh, as in it touched upon it and you expanded it uh, substantially. Uh, let me stop your sharing so that we come onto the screen bigger. Yeah. Okay. So, um, can we spend the next 10 15 minutes on some of the questions? Uh, is it okay? Yeah, but my hearing is a little poor. We have to slowly talk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I will shout out a little bit. Yeah. So this, uh, this is uh, this is quite uh, quite a fascinating uh, topic, and I have you know I have uh, listened to your uh, talk on uh, Periplus of the Eritrean Sea at least uh, twice before. <laughs> Still, you know this. So much that uh, we really have to uh, uh, discuss in this. Firstly, are all the Indian ports, so this is a question from one of the uh, uh, viewers, Mohan Dattar, the uh, Red Sea ports, or at least, you know, whatever the periplus of the Eritrean Sea of the Indian coastline, the names mentioned, do we have the equivalent modern Indian names fully mapped? Equivalent Indian? Indian names of today's Indian names. Yeah, we have, we have equivalent. Yeah, we have all, all equivalents are available now. All equivalents. For instance, what he calls Musaris is today Patanam. Patanam, correct. Uh, now, what Naisanda is, we know it is now um, uh, Kote. And what is Bakare is Bakare. And so, all those things. For instance, uh, he calls Sopatma. Sopatma is actually our Chaturanga Patanam, you know. Which, right. which became so much. So 
most names are very clear. The one name which was uh, getting a little confused even by K. Nilagata Shastri mm -hmm. was Aragus. Aragu is a name he has given. Okay. And he says there is a big emporium there. And uh, he called Aragu as Urayu. But later on, it was found out the Aragu is not Urayu, but Aragan Kulam. You know? uh, Aragan Kulam. Okay. Yeah. So that has been proved already. So uh, there were uh, some mistakes. Actually, uh, there is not large mistake, but uh, uh, only some mild mistakes. Otherwise, more or less, all points are very, very clear. Okay. The, the second obvious question is, the whole of West Coast is dotted with so yeah. many ports. Yeah. Where so many ports really required? Even today, if you go to Konkan area, there are ports after ports, you know, you know, they don't transport bricks and tiles by road. They transport by boats only, even today, even today. Really? You know, okay. Even today, from Ratagiri, you can uh, stand in the Bombay Harbour, you can see uh, oh, large boats coming with tiles. You know, it is very cheap, you know, to transfer because Ratnagiri manufactures maximum tiles for the ship building. Okay. And they send it by boat and that comes to Bombay Harbour. But there's a separate area for uh, the inland water, uh, inland uh, ships, you know, they go there and um, download. So that is the cheapest method. You know? Has it uh, more to do with the Arabian Sea versus Bay of Bengal? That yeah, we there is cannot, a difference. Can we do exactly the same on the East Coast as well? The coast there is a large difference. There is a large difference between Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal. Okay. Arabian Sea provides places for ports very well, but in the eastern side, that is the sea, what we see, Coromandel of course, there is no place other than Vishalpatnam which provided a good port, you know, restaurant. You know, in the water, you have to walk at least a, a kilometer before you get five meter depth, you know. Whereas in the east, you find very good depths. You know. Here, there is no depth. And the reason given is where you say Krishna and Godavari bring sand. You know. Such a lot of sand. And right, right. Okay, okay. Um, Ravi Shankar uh, mentions that Khufu's ship is much bigger than the Abydos boats which is 43.4 meters long and 5.9 meters wide, considered to be the oldest intact ship, he okay. says. Today? Uh, I mean, uh, historically, uh, historically... No, it may not be correct because the, even when Kogan and Day came, they came by Eagle, which was, a, which was only a boat, you know, which was uh, hardly 15 meters long, you know, that was not very big. So... No, he talked about Khufu, Khufu's ship, which is the Egyptian uh, vessel. Oh, Egyptian ship. Could be, I don't know. I don't know the details of the Egyptian ship, but they had built a very big ship, so I was told. In fact, uh, there is a mention of three master, you know, when three master are there, that, uh, that you see, it must be at least 30 meters long, not less, you know. Uh, okay. So, uh, there, there were long ships. But then it depended on the, this thing. But Indians had not the big ships at all. Their Ambis and Sangara and all their smaller ships and single mosques mostly. Okay. And Indians had not uh, specialized in rudder. They did not know rudder at all. Okay. They were only steering over there. Okay. Right. Uh, there is a question from Ramesh Babu. Uh, which exactly is the port of Tindis shown in the Periplus? Is it Ponnani? Kadalundi or Bepur? Uh, there are, there, over a period, they have been changing the names. Actually, what uh, originally thought to be, now for instance, Musiris was considered as Kranganur till about, uh, uh, say, about six, seven years back. Only okay. seven years back, they proved it is Patanam and not uh, Kranganur. So, okay. there are uh, different names begin, being changed, but we do not know. And ports have been changing by themselves, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, even within one year, you find one coast is changing in shape. Like right. one tsunami, we found such a lot of change in shape. Correct. That's true. That is true. So, uh, which one is Tindis according to you? Which? Uh, Tindis. Uh. Tindis is Tundi that was there. No, it is Tindis. not there. Okay. No, it is not there. Tindis is old Tundi. And Tundi is mentioned in Sangam literature. Correct. Musuri, Tundi, uh, uh, both are mentioned, right? 
Tundi yeah. and Musiri. Tundi and Musiri all both in um, uh, West. We, were, we have a Tundi on the West West side also. But this right. Tundi is on the Eastern side. Okay. Okay. Uh, there is a question uh, uh, from Sri Vidya Jayakumar. In modern days, we have private ports. Was such a concept existing in medieval times? Or all ports were owned by the state? What? Pri- I mean, today we are talking about private ports, as in not ah, owned by the state. Was such a concept existing even then? Or was everything owned by the the country, the state, uh, whichever was a ruling power? <laughs> I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, please. Actually, as I said, the merchant guilds control the trade. Ah. They were not under the control of the government at all. They control the trade. In fact, a merchant guild will decide what is the uh, goods to be transported from um, India to, say, China. And when it is decided, it is he who talks to the ship owners and decides as to which ship to take. Mm. Government will not interfere at all. That is a beautiful thing in this world. And they said the government did not interfere with them. They only provided the, the whatever facilities required and Rajendra Chola brought the Navy only to protect his merchantmen. That okay. is my concept and my own concept. Then. Okay, fine. Uh, so this, you know, let's let's go to some of the interesting bits. Uh, I'll just take only a couple of uh, minutes. This Kani Churam uh, in uh, China, the detailed Tamil inscription that you read uh, <laughs> of... Uh, Kublai Khan's son, uh, the uh, temple built uh, Kanechuram. Yeah. Right? Uh, the, you know, in that's one that we talk about, right? But did they build a series of temples in other places that we know of? Even in Kadaram, for example, or uh, Sri Vijaya, we know that the Sri Vijayan kings had given a lot of donations to temples in Tamil Nadu. Yeah. But I don't think we have found temples built by the Indian merchants, Tamil merchants in those places, other than the one Kanechuram that you uh, talked about in detail. No, in uh, if you see Bali Islands and all that, there are several temples. Unfortunately, no records are available, but it is very, I am sure that uh, the government of the day was not forwarding money and all that. The merchants still went there so Correct. when they started their stuff, now like today, you know, when you go from one place to place, migrants, they build their own temples. America, how many Hindu temples have been by, built by the people? So it is by private donation and the people. Well, that's right. Them. That's right. What I was saying was that they built a temple in China, but it doesn't look very clear that they had done it in other places. No, yes, it doesn't. There are no records of such as Okay. There are some records in uh, 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 North Indian temples also in Bali, but such a clear record like uh, uh, what we see here, yeah. that nowhere we can find. Okay. That is true. That is true. I, I had a couple of quick questions, and uh, you have you have said that uh, many times that Mahab- Mahabalipuram could not have been a port city. No, I don't think so. Right. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, you, you you have you have clearly mentioned your reasons why that is the case. So probably that Saduranga Patanam would have no. been uh, near Petru. No, Sangam calls near Petru a port. Near Petru, correct. Near Petru, near Petru. Now Saduranga Patanam, you can say near Petru. Okay. So say two things. Why I say that is uh, could not have. There has been no port in the ancient countries anywhere in the world where the river is not flowing into the sea. A port is called no such place. There is nowhere in the world where port is there only where there is a river flowing into the sea. Okay. So there is no river flowing into the sea in Mahabalipuram. Whereas in near Petru, there is a river flowing into that place. Now, okay. Mailapur could have been a port because Kuvam was a little north, it was flowing into the sea. So that could have given that uh, little extra advantage, that's all. Okay. But Mailapur had been, but why I am against anybody talking about Mahabalipuram being a port is. It's a rocky area. Mm, mm. No, no fool will build a port at rocky area because ships will get damaged. No time. Most of the ships running aground in our colonial time have occurred in that area only. They hit the rocks and go down. So 
nobody will build a ship <laughs> there is such a lot of rock. even today after tsunami you found in uh, nearly two kilometers into the sea rocks protruding so this submarine fellows wanted to take when they came to my advice i told them don't take it to mahabalipuram we can never reach the shore but <laughs> they and came back you know without say then they came and told me what you said is right because right. there is full of rocks that's all that is my simple reckoning okay uh, and in that uh, connection the last question ramji nagarajan asks did we see pumbuhar mentioned in these records starting from periplus and uh, uh, then you know my extended question uh, you, you know wha- can you consider pumbuhar as a full and proper port yeah pumbuhar was a very good port actually uh, pumbuhar was a very that is mentioned in periplus also of course uh, yeah uh, periplus what was it called in periplus yeah. and uh, the good thing about pumbuhar is that kaveri pumbuttam had fa- facilities for foreigners much better than any other port in the world they had that sangam literature also confirms that there was cherries built for foreign traders uh, are, are you are you quoting from patina palai yeah patina palai yes. patina palai clearly says patina and i didn't mention here because this is not directly connected to the subject that i was talking okay. in patina palai it says uh, without lowering the mast nipai kalayadu without removing the pai maram the ships could enter the port you know that means today also our ships don't enter into the port by their own power you know only tax bring them in because it is difficult to control but those yeah. days the ship was i have written in one of my papers that me pai kalayadu me chumai neeladu that is not removing any cargo for entering the port today also calcutta entry ship entry calcutta port lighten the ship in haldi and then only enter because the depth is not there meepai kalayadu mesuchuma ikat kurage adu that means without lowering that pole pai maram without reducing that weight they could enter that means they had the very good idea of maintaining a harbor they must have had some uh, dredgers also thurwari couples i don't know could have been possible but puhar was one of the best ports available okay uh, uh, our archaeologist sridharan says vasava samudram near vayalur yielded roman amphoras and other antiquities which is near mamalapuram mahabalipuram uh, vasava samudram had a lot of roman antiquities uh. vasava samudram near vayalur which is near mahabalipuram uh, that is correct it is it is closer to sadrangapatinam anyway yeah that is correct oh, close at other near petru is mentioned near petru is mentioned and near petru had all the facilities as pubuhar had okay so it's only few kilometers away so, uh, from mahabalipuram so right. that could have been mistaken we don't know palavas went from there first of all palavas didn't have that big ships like chola at right. all yes. palavas ships were the hardly boats only and right. palavas were not known to be sailors Cholas and Pontias were uh, sailors. They were able, and Cholas were the best sailors. So Very, I feel that way. I mean, I, so, so many times I keep telling sure. about Mahabharata. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. That was wonderful. No, no, it is my pleasure. In fact, uh, uh, at this age and time, to be talking to people. Oh, yes, we are really thankful to you that you know you could spend time at this age. and uh, you know uh, if your health permits you would like to keep uh, hearing you talk about all these things and <laughs> thankfully you know internet is making it happen you can sit at your home i don't know if it's your back is holding it well but no, no. Like, like i will it tell you it is the same as those days sailing you know sailors were sailing the facility <laughs> facilitator was king i am right. like a sailor i am doing all this but you are the facilitator you have done wonderful work so thank you very much thank you sir thank you let's get to kishore to uh, uh, get his closing remarks for the day thank you sir thank you very much thank you thank you thank th- thank you mr narsingha that that was that was uh, indeed uh, thank you sir uh, indeed really yes you can you can thank yeah. you thank you very much yeah go ahead kishore so on uh, on that note we we come to the uh, uh, end of uh, our day one program uh if you uh, if you con- if you watch this uh, uh, today please continue to join us all days for the next 6 days uh, program starts sharp at 5:30 pm and should end about this time which is around 8:30 pm that is what we planned every single day until the 11th of june uh, if you uh, come to our youtube channel for the first time today 
uh, please click on uh, subscribe and then go to Tamil Heritage Trust. Click on subscribe so that you get your uh, your YouTube feed regularly. Uh, this is uh, tomorrow's program. We have uh, again two fantastic lectures tomorrow. Uh, first up at 5:30 p.m. we have Dr. Yadavir Singh uh, Rawat, former director of Gujarat State Archaeology. Who's go so tomorrow is uh, we're going to spend uh, on the Arabian Sea coast, right? Or to be more specific, in Gujarat. So we have Dr. Yadavir Singh Rawat talking about the uh, Harappan coastal settlements and their maritime connections. And then followed by that at 7 p.m., uh, we've heard about the uh, Kachi merchants and how they made a mark in the Middle East and also in uh, you know Zanzibar, in, which is in East Africa, the uh, Tanzanian archipelago. Uh, so we have Dr. Chaya Goswami, who's actually written a book on this subject, on the Kachi merchants in East, in East Africa and the ivory trade that they did in Zanzibar. So she is going to be talking about the Kachi merchants and how they left a mark in Arabia and East Africa. So tomorrow we're going to spend a lot of time on the western coast of uh, uh, India and specifically in Gujarat and Kutch. So don't miss this. Please join us once again tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. Uh, you know, if you go to Tamil Heritage Trust's uh, YouTube channel, you should be able to see our lectures live tomorrow. Thank you very much and looking forward to seeing you and to having your company tomorrow.